Hello, my fellow Westorians. It's Nime time. Nime? I just said Nime. Nime is not a word, my friends. But it is. Nymeria time? <laughs> That's what Daylight Savings Time yeah, does to you. It throws exactly. you off. It makes you call it Nime instead of time. <laughs> Did you say Siberia? <laughs> Nymeria. Nymeria. Okay. Well, yes, time is... Nime for short. <laughs> <laughs> We're off to a roaring start today. Hello and welcome to History of Westeros podcast. Yes, it's another episode of Valar We Read Us for the World of Ice and Fire, where we take the topics presented in that grand tome and expand them into something a little more thorough, a little more detailed. We research, we pull things from the real world. And today we have a guest. Uh, introducing Jamie Redfern of the History of podcast series. You know, I was introduced to you through Hannibal and the Punic Wars, your series on that. I was a listener. I listened to that whole thing. It was really fun. And so I thought of you for this. But you've got a lot of other shows. So please tell us about all your great shows and say hello to History of Westeros listeners. Hello, History of Westeros listeners. I'm Jamie. Um, I've been in the history podcasting game for about 10 years or so, so I've done a, a variety of shows. Um, Hannibal and the Punic Wars being a firm favorite. I've also done a biography of Alexander the Great, mm. um, a series on modern Middle Eastern history called Arab Springer History. And I'm currently on, how long, like six years, seven years into a, a history of the United States. Uh, which is plodding along at an incredibly slow pace. Which I'm <laughs> really enjoying finding lots of uh, digressions to go into along the way. So I'm curious, just just a random question related to your American podcast. Do you know? Do you have like demographics on your like what what countries listen? Is it is it a lot of American listeners listening to your American history podcast? Or? Mostly Americans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right on. I mean, I think they just like the accent. That's all it is. <laughs> well, we love the um, English accent. That's just a thing. Americans have like a reverse stereotype. It's like, oh, British people, they just sound so smart. <laughs> I'm just making stuff up as I go along. But they're like, oh, he must be like a professor or something. <laughs> Sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, just skated on that for the past 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a little bit of foray into American history here on the show when we talked about folklore and how folklore worked in Westeros and how we used American folklore as an example example do you cover any american folklore on that show i'm not into it properly i'm still like just getting out of the um like into the early actual american history i think i've oh, literally okay. just covered the revolution oh, okay so yeah it's so, not really that period yet okay good yeah so um i'm still in the like dissecting mythology phase right on um which i suppose is also plenty of in in westeros yeah definitely definitely a lot of a lot of crossover george likes to use a lot of real world influence the one of the things we're going to talk about today of course is comparisons with rome and carthage and valyria and Giscari and a few other real world comparisons also we're gonna talk about war elephants as a big fun topic for hannibal and the punic wars and we're looking forward to elephants playing a role in the winds of winter and beyond because we know they're part of the golden company and we may see them elsewhere and there's also mammoths which as I suppose that's, there's no real world comparison for that, but it's probably similar to War Elephants. So, hey, you know, fun stuff, lots of connections. And I've got a, a fun little anecdote. Every time Jamie and I talk, and usually it's on Twitter or email or something, because, you know, I, you know, that's usually how people interact online. And I just can't help but type Jamie, the, the Jamie Lannister spelling. <laughs> You know, every single Hi, time. Mary. And I tell him every single time. I'm like, I did it again. I typed your name, Jamie, and then delete, 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 M-I-E. I'm get not confident right. I've ever spelled Jamie correctly. <laughs> and when I was making like, uh, this episode, how did I write it in the description? You did it too, huh? Yeah, I did it too. <laughs> we are, <laughs> we are like very indoctrinated. <laughs> Sean gets spelled a lot of different ways, by the way. S H A W N S H A U N. That is true. S E A N, the correct way. It might have me. more spellings Seen. than any other American name that I know of, anyway. And not that it's really more of an Irish name, I guess, mm -hmm. but like names that are used in America. Yeah. <laughs> it's got like six. Yeah, there's a lot of spellings of that name. Anyway. So many. All right. So we've got some great stuff today. We've got some fun stuff today. And uh, give some shout outs here. Thanks to our patrons for. Uh, keeping the lights on and supporting us for creating additional content. We've got the Brandon the Builder episode really close to being out. Shea is just working on the, the uh, last little bits, the transcription and stuff. And then we'll be posting the, working on the uh, Brandon the Buildings of Brandon episode, which will come out not too long afterwards. So back-to-back -back scripted episodes coming out soon. 
Also give a shout out to Nina for her invaluable assistance with notes and other additional research. She's got a uh, her blog, Good Queen Alley. That's Good Queen Alley with one L. Tumblr.com. Recent post on there is about ritualism and old gods worship. Kind of uh, a, a talking about how some oddities of the way the old gods are worshipped and comparisons to other religions and how it's a little bit of a exception in a lot of ways. Good topic. Check that out. As we've been doing recently, we start each episode with a trivia question. So let's do that before we kick off our first discussion. After taking Marine, Daenerys sends envoys out to several places in the region, seeking allies and trading partners. Which former Valyrian city sends her a cedar chest containing her envoys' heads by way of answer? Of course, that answer being no. I don't suppose you cut off heads to say yes, but your <laughs> mileage may vary. <laughs> Play on opposite day. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, she cut, they cut our, cut our heads off. Yay, they accepted. Never send an envoy on opposite day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Never. They didn't know it was opposite day in that city that, whose name I will reveal at the end of the episode. So, so this time we're going to talk about expansion. The title, as the title implies, oh, well, it doesn't imply, it says straightforwardly, <laughs> wars with old gifts, uh, founded cities, uh, slavery and the comparisons that we talked about, the war elephants, and then government and culture, there'll be some more of that. We talked a lot about that last time, but of course it bleeds into multiple eras. We'll save things like the free cities, the doom, and the century of blood for another time. Those are pretty huge topics, and we, we can't cover it all in one day. And it looks like we've got a super chat from TKOK Podcast Network. It says, watching while I try and crush corporate greed and embracing the magic of the mountain in Park City, Utah. Hashtag Babe Manor. You're in Park City, Utah. All right, Tommy. That's cool. Appreciate the you checking in with us while you're out there. And definitely good luck on crushing that corporate greed. We uh, The world needs more of that. The crushing, not the corporate greed. <laughs> <laughs> definitely doesn't need more of the corporate greed. <laughs> we'll see. We're going to get into some ancient versions of, of corporate, maybe greed. Corporate's not the right word, but it's definitely greed. Uh, let's start... With a quote, and then um, we'll get a reaction from Jamie on this initial comparison of Rome versus Valyria by the man himself, George R. R. Martin. First, we'll have the question, and then uh, Shea will read George's answer. Sean's going to read the question. Real quick, who was this question asked by? Do we know who's ST? I honestly do not know. We couldn't figure out who ST was, oh, okay. but this is from the the SSM, the, the So Spake Martin Smarter Collection. Smarter Travel, that's who that is. Who is it? Smart, okay. That's the, uh, the name of the website. Where it, that's oh. the, 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 the magazine or whatever. No wonder I couldn't figure it yeah, out. I, I thought it was a person. Yeah, yeah. It's Smarter <laughs> Travel. Yeah, there you go. Okay, that's right. well, that explains it. So, yeah, so this is George R. Martin being asked a question. I think this was in 2012-ish, um, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. When it was, this is what he thinks, and this is the, yeah. Go ahead. Valeria is a place that we never actually see in the books, but its presence is felt throughout. I've always associated it with the Rome, associated it with the Roman Empire, but when you describe the doom of Valeria with the boiling seas and giant tsunamis, it also calls to mind our own legends of Atlantis. Am I on the right track with these comparisons? Yes, and once again, I've mixed and matched. There are elements of Valyria that are similar to Rome. It was the dominant world power for hundreds of years. Unlike Rome, the dominance was partially based on magic and on dragons, as well as on the strength of their legions. But there is certainly an element to that. Of course, the fall of the Roman Empire was a slow process that took centuries, while Valyria fell overnight. So in that sense, it is more like the Atlantis legends. And then another time, uh, he gave a s somewhat similar but a notably different answer um, on a similar from a similar question. Go ahead, Sean. Valeria, at the zenith of its power, was neither a kingdom nor an empire, or at least it had neither a king nor an emperor. It was more akin to the old Roman Republic. I suppose, in theory, the franchise included all freeholders, that is, freeborn landowners. Of course, in practice... Wealthy, highborn, and sorcerously powerful families came to dominate. What a term, sorcerously powerful. That's <laughs> George for you. <laughs> so, Jamie, what's your first reaction to some of this? Is is the do you think the Rome, uh, Valeria comparison is pretty strong, or is it just something that works on on a surface level? Or what's your general reaction to it? I think it's very strong, um, and it works in quite a lot of different ways. Um, I think when everything in the uh, Game of Thrones world is all um, like it works in lots of different levels. So there are lots of things you can find comparisons to. But the way that um, I suppose you think of like the hist, like the present day 
um, we're all affected by like the ghosts of the past. Mm. Like it affects everything, every bit of the consciousness. And when you deal with what I've like modern day Westeros or Essos, like you can feel Valeria in every little bit of it, like um, hiding there in the background. And that's what I feel we have today with the Roman Empire, that it's it's always there in the background. Um, in the Middle Ages, which I suppose is what um, a lot of it's based off, um, you find like the odd little traces of Rome hidden away in there and things that have nothing to do with it. There's a, a history of the Dukes of Normandy that was written in the 11th century. Uh, that if you read it on the face of it, it looks just like a history of the Dukes of Normandy, mm -hmm. but it's actually a big play on uh, the Aeneid and Virgil. And <laughs> it's all that, that culture is just embedded so in there and everyone knows what it is, even if they don't quite understand it. So uh -huh. it's like, oh, this story is familiar, but no one knows why. And it's because of these like cultural traditions. And I think there's, there's so much of that in there. So while you can compare Valyria to a lot of different things, uh, Rome or more generally like the Greco-Roman world, I think that works is probably a very strong analogy. Right on. You know, it strikes me interestingly because that is what you say is very true. And it's true here in America too, because we're obviously mostly offshoots of of uh, European culture. Well, obviously there's a lot more going on than that, but that is the, that's a, the, the dominant cultural strain. And we don't have Roman buildings here, but they're all over Europe. You have them in England. But we still have that influence here. So it must be even stronger there where you like literally still have structures built by the Romans that are still there, <laughs> stale standing, and, and they're just constant reminders. Where I live um, in Manchester, there is the ruins of a Roman fort, no joke, about 200 meters that way. Oh, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, when, when I went to Europe, we were just like, I was just stunned because there's just there's nothing in America that's like, you have to go to like find Me uh, Spanish buildings to find anything that's older than like 300 years. And so you just like go in England or in Ireland, we're just like blown away. But like, that's a thousand years old. Like I've never seen anything, a, a building a thousand years old. <laughs> like there's just, <laughs> everything's so much older here. It's so cool. So that really does give an impact. And, and like you're saying, yeah, there's, there's echoes of Valyria everywhere, whether it's the cities that they founded that are still around, whether they're bloodlines, their look, like you still have that going, or the roads, there's so many, yeah, so. I mean, the language, like High Valyrian, yeah. Heck yeah, you're right, they, people still speak yeah. that. The, the references to uh, uh, their equivalent of pop culture, you know, their myth mythological characters. Yeah. Just like we referenced, I talked about this before, we might reference King Arthur or Noah, even though they're far away or, you know, in time and location, but they're still pervasive throughout our culture same thing in westeros saw the, the heroes in a culture of valeria saw a joke today mm -hmm. about italy deciding to reclaim its ancient borders <laughs> it was just a map of the roman empire <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i was like yeah i don't know i don't know if you can pull that off italy but <laughs> <laughs> it's a good joke so there's a couple other things that i would point out that are that have some similarity beyond just culture and influence for example if you take Slaver's Bay and compare it to the Mediterranean, you've got there's a little bit of similarities there. It's, there's obviously some substantial differences, too. But you've got a lot of the same powerful nations set up like in the Mediterranean. One of the big features, of course, is Egypt and the Nile is a gigantic river. And you have the Rhine, which is to the west of Valyria instead of across the, the water there. But it's a similar sort of situation. And we when we talked about the Rhoynar in our episodes on Nymeria, we went pretty deep with comparisons to Egypt at the time and other nations, uh, but not Rome because they weren't similar to Rome. <laughs> but you also have like the Valer Valerian Peninsula, in shattered as it is, it's just a little bit like Italy projecting out into the center there. It gives them a little more, I don't know, geographical prominence maybe. Uh, they're certainly in the center. And as we talked about last time, there's a lot of centrism there too. So... Do you think that's a pretty big uh, deal for, for Rome's dominance, the fact that they were positioned in the middle of the Mediterranean? you think that was pretty relevant, or is that mostly just other factors that mattered more than that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Like it's uh, the There's a lot of different influences that they're getting, so um, they're able to develop their military traditions by being um, that close to Greece and Epirus and then the, like, the Phoenician settlements. Um, while being like far enough away that they're not overwhelmed by it. everything's quite close. It's really good for trade. Mm. It's like a perfect situation. I really like the um, Valeria as it, um, Italy comparison, as you can kind of take it like another step if you change 
time zones, not time zones, eras. <laughs> that um, like when you think like after the fall, when you've got all the um, Italian city states popping up and the constant fighting between them is basically the free cities after after the doom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially some and some of them, George took that influence very directly. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What about some of these other? I see some some notes here uh, that you wrote. Maybe um, you wrote Valeria's Greco-Roman versus Gissa's Phoenician, and that's cool. Yeah, I have Phoenician. Uh, the Phoenician culture, for those who don't know out there, were the the precursors of the Carthaginian civilization. Is that the right way to put it? Yeah. Okay. So and so there's yeah, like, a um, lot of that. yeah. You, you you can explain it better than me. So <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I mean, like um, Carthage is just a Phoenician colony. So the uh, the old cities of um like um tyre um sidon that are in um modern day of lebanon um that you think of those as so ancient and um the way that uh, like this is described as being older than valeria um valeria is like the up and coming challenger to um gis and that reminds me a lot of the um how the greek city states as they start to develop trading networks uh, they start to move into Western, the Western Mediterranean, into the Black Sea, and there's that competition yeah. between the um, Phoenician merchants, and then eventually that takes on a military sphere when you've got the um, like the campaigns of Alexander going in, fighting against um, all these cities, this older civilization, and then just smashing it over, and then the uh, the Punic Wars, obviously, with the battles between Rome and Carthage, neither of which are the like, origins of their civilizations, but they take it to the military extreme, and then you've got this titanic battle. Um, I think, yeah, it works really well. Right on. I gotta say, I, I appreciate that's humorous the way you said Alexander went to war with all these cities. Yeah, yeah, just everyone. He's like, yeah, uh, pretty much uh, everyone. All of them, yeah. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, he's like, I want all of you. Yeah, I'm not really, I'm not a, I don't have small ambitions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, and the roads are another one that really remind me of that. There's that old saying, all roads lead to Rome. Good example of a cultural, like, touchstone phrase or something, whatever the right word is, that we still hear today, even though it doesn't mm. really have, like, a meaning. I, who we don't use it for anything that I can think of that's relevant. It's just a phrase that survived. Like I, I can't think of a, a, like a useful context to say that other than as historical, but here, but with the Valyrian dragon roads were a similar thing. And, and uh, Jamie, you write here that the Royal roads of Persia were somewhat similar. So that's, that's a, a curiosity. I, I'm not familiar with the Royal roads of Persia. Um, so it was like a way of um, like subjecting, uh, I th I th probably like the, the first big, like road system in the world oh, okay. um, where it's going along connecting the different bits of uh, the Persian empire. So you've got them going from Egypt and uh, modern day Turkey all the way through Mesopotamia into Iran um, and using that as a, the basis of a, of dominance really that you're able mm -hmm. to quickly move the key elements and the messaging around the empire and use that to dominate. And I, that's one of the things I love about George's writing is like those real world bits that get in there. Mm. And it, yeah, that is exactly how you dominate an area. You won't be able to dominate it if you can't traverse it quickly, if you can't communicate quickly. So the focus on the roads, I think, is a really nice touch that all the, the big empires in world history are all based around the um, like the road systems or the uh, communication systems. So it's really nice getting that in there. Yeah, like things that would Which make is, sense. Like you, yeah, yeah. just a, a lot logistical things. Like Sean, that's the kind of thing you appreciate yeah. a lot too, huh? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was also going to point out that that same idea of the roads importance is also why being uh, on a central coastal piece of land is important. Mm -hmm. When you're able to get your ships in and out more quickly and readily to more different uh, population centers and such, uh, a port in Italy is ports in general, you know, like, uh, you know, are, are going to be more valuable because you can get more quickly information and goods. But even a port in somewhere like Italy, which is surrounded by other ports, right, mm -hmm. is more valuable than a port in, you know, I don't know, uh, Scandinavia or whatever. And here's where we have the double whammy from Valeria, because, yes, they had the roads, they had the access, the quickness they could get from place to place with an army pretty quickly. 
But then they have the additional ability to get there really fast with a dragon or two or six or however many. I mean, <laughs> Always helps. Yeah, like just this whole nother level of, of operation of we can get there quickly. You, you That's a thing, ancient world thing. Like sometimes the consideration is how could they ever bring their army here in time for us before we can do this or that or the other, whatever planning or plotting they have. By the time they get here, we'll have the city under control and, you know, et cetera. That's just not going to be the case with valyria not only the dragons but things like the glass candles that give them uh, m somewhat modern communication ability uh, a microcosm of that perhaps <clears throat> for lack of even outside of ancient times you know when the american colonies declare war england's like you just wait till three months from now <laughs> when our boats get over there <laughs> What's that? Since you, Sean, you wanted to talk about Sparta at some point in this episode, that reminds me of, um, well, who was it? Was it, was it Alexander that threatened Sparta? Said, we'll bring our armies over and, you know, if, if we come there, you'll do this. And they just, Sparta responds, if. If. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> was that Alexander? Who, who threat? who was that response to? Who was that? I can't I remember. I don't think it was Alexander. Yeah. It was, um, his father, Philip. II. Oh, it was Philip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Philip, close, yeah. but not quite. That's cool. All right on. Yeah. Philip, another quite a piece of work that guy was <laughs> oh <boy>. yeah <laughs> so let's talk about speaking of powerful families we laugh we left off last time talking about the 40 families let's pick that back up it wasn't a complete discussion and it's super relevant here because as we all well know the world is mostly ruled by wealthy people that was even more true in the ancient world because here they lead there's like a, a veneer of everyone's we, we say everyone's tr supposed to be treated the same. It doesn't work out that way, but at least there's like this veneer of everyone's supposed to be equal before the law. But in like a lot of ancient societies, no. Wealth, nobility, certain things like this, just you actually were above the law in a lot of cases. Or you have power that makes it even more blatant that you could get away with just about anything. So this is a really interesting topic to me because it determines how governments are run and it determines things like who you conquer and and all these things that we still talk about with rome a lot of these things were are were, the seeds of these were planted if not the large activities by these very small groups of very powerful people it wasn't necessarily their intent to to have the 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 fallout that of history that, that that it's had but it certainly worked out that way they just wanted to you know be powerful and wealthy and and popular or whatever <laughs> so okay so 40 families uh let's have this quote i don't did we read this quote last time i don't think so did we i didn't i don't think so anyway well let's have it again or have it for the first time <laughs> at its apex valeria was the greatest city in the known world the center of civilization within its shining walls Two score rival houses vied for power and glory in court and council, rising and falling in an endless, subtle, oft savage struggle for dominance. So it's not entirely clear when this came about. It certainly came around after the Dragon Lord stuff started with Valyria. So because the 40 families were all Dragon Rider families. So clearly it had to have come after they tamed dragons unless some proto version of it existed before you never know i suppose but we wonder whether they originated from certain class whether it's like a, a, a similarity to say the roman patrician system where it was just that these top families sort of had f dibs on the dragons or something along those lines it's 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 harder to say because blood matters more in, in these pla in these in this world with literal dragon connections and all that so what do you think about, Jamie, what do you think about this family system concept and how does this compare to, say, the Roman consular system or other ancient world systems where the powerful families are basically in charge and the, the leaders are chosen from these powerful families? And just uh, tell us what you think about all this. It's a, it's a pretty broad topic, so I don't want to try to pin you down too much. I just want to hear what you uh, your thoughts on it. So when you look at, uh, I suppose, uh, like city-state oligarchies and how they generally tend to emerge. Um, they start off from like a relatively small community and you look to who can protect that community. Mm. Um, it'll be the stronger warriors um, who can protect them and the people who can afford to do that. So you've got the people who can afford to have weapons, the people who can afford horses, who can afford chariots. Um, and then by virtue of protecting 
they entrench the power and then eventually that becomes an aristocracy over the course of about three or four hundred years so i think it makes sense to play that out in valeria with who can do the protecting who can look after the people it's the people who can handle dragons Mm -hmm. who know how to um who can protect them with that and so that naturally leads to a oh if you play that out over a few centuries a group of people who would have that um close relationship who naturally end up as like a a leadership group with all the power and all the money Mm. Um, and then by that point it's almost unquestioned you can't get out of it you're in a a classical athens or something where you've got a lot of powerful families controlling things or you've got the same situation in rome where it's the people who are the elites who can afford to go campaigning (laughs) every season they're not they don't need to think oh i need to get back to the farm to go look after my cabbages or something like that it's so you can go out yeah you can do the campaigning you can become a general you can go take wealth from other people um and it just naturally builds over time until you get ultra powerful families who can dominate the course of empires like the the julii family um where you've got like marius uh who's elected consul six times you've got julius caesar you've got um augustus all coming from the same family group that really feels familiar to a situation like westeros or Essos, where you have these families ruling for hundreds if not thousands of years and they're just like yep the starks of two thousand years ago did this yeah you've got i mean maybe the time scale's larger in in this westeros situation but it's pretty darn big for for these families um so some of these families probably trace their descent to pre-roman times too i would imagine as well right Mm-hmm. Yeah, like some of them tracing themselves to like gods and other things like that as well. Oh yeah, you trace it back as far as you can get. I mean, the the Julii claimed that they were descendants of Aeneas, mm-hmm. who came from Troy, who was the son of was it um, Venus. So yeah, connected to the gods through <laughs> that way. As you and do. then you try and trace your history back into the uh, yeah the mythology and all of that. Um, which when you get phrases like 40 family, so, like it seems so familiar, but it's like almost imaginary. Like you can do a lot of constructing and inventing family trees to put yourself into certain families if you want to be. Yeah, it's not like a lot of people and can get check. <laughs> <laughs> so you do wonder like how much of this is actually 40 families? How much of it is just, oh, whoever happens to be rich yeah they can be part of our family we want we want a slice of that pie oh, that's a good point because right romans they did they did a lot it was a lot of adopting in ancient rome like yeah. just ad- adults adopting adult you, you can you could even have a, younger people adopting older people couldn't you have that yeah yeah adoption yeah, is very different <laughs> than the way we perceive yeah. it now <laughs> well, that's really interesting i wonder yeah i wonder if valeria did some of that i mean i mean it's it makes sense like a marriage connections are often about adding you know share combining wealth combining power to create even more power but hmm. it makes a lot of sense too just when you think about the nature of marriages and families and i don't know traditions both historically and within this martin's world that there's a lot of crossover families marry across each other and it and people die lines end. someone doesn't have a son etc so you can imagine those 40 families probably sway they're probably like a pool of families vying to get into the 40 and among them they had different levels of claim right Mm -hmm. uh and within the 40 there are probably some who are on the outs who are like you know you know if if they don't have a son right now or if they if they betray the one of the top five houses one more time they're not going to get a marriage betrothal this other family is and it's probably a, a flux of who exactly was included in the 40 over time. I would agree with that. And I thought I want to ask a question I want to ask you, Jamie. What, what's sort of like a general idea of like the process for falling in or out of that top group? Like if you're in it and you fall out of it, I imagine it's, I'm not, it's a really hard group to get into in the first place. But I know like, for example, one of the reasons Sean wanted to bring up Sparta is the shrinking upper class. And they just, mm. it just kind of imploded on itself because it got so small. The, and because it, the, the barriers to get in were just were increasingly difficult and new families weren't being created. How does, how does that maybe play out here as a, as a comparison? Yeah, I think it, it tends to play out depending on like how closed off the society mm the society is that when you do get very close societies like sparta um you just end up with a mess like um you can trace sparta's history very neatly 
um, as like their prominence um, against the size of the population. Um, that when they, I think there's a constitutional reform in about the 650s BC, um, when all these rules around who can be a Spartan and who isn't, and like the rules of inheritance all get established. Mm -hmm. And then there's about 100, 150 years where the population's somewhat stable. So that's when you've got like the wars against Persia and you've got the uh, the Peloponnesian Wars against uh, Athens, where Sparta's kind of doing okay, but losing a lot of people through war. People are dying. There aren't that many Spartans anyway. And then it kind of just hits, uh, like goes off a cliff. The population plummets mm. in the 300s. Yeah. And then within about 100 years, you've gone from a population of a couple thousand, which for ancient Greek is quite it's reasonable. Um, but when you're down to having like hundreds of, of potential fighting men, you're not going to be able to rule an empire. Yeah, no one's afraid of you anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah I seem to remember. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure I've got numbers wrong, and it's going to change over time. But I think at one point Sparta was like tenth the population of Athens, Oof. but was still on par with them militarily. And I and I think at that time Sparta. See, the thing is, I don't know if this counts the, the entire population and all the the, the Hellenites, the, war, the Hellots, know, yeah. The, Helots, yeah, sorry. Um, but I think there were like something like 40,000 and Athens was like 400,000. But then it got to the point where there were only like 700 Spartans, like, <laughs> not counting their slave population. Yeah. But yeah, there was only hundreds of them. And so they, they just didn't have enough people to maintain the society they had been trying to. Yeah, 100%. Like when you've got Athens has a slightly more tolerant version on adding people into its um society on bringing people in it's still fairly strict so it, it manages a bit longer but it does eventually fall away but then you get somewhere like rome where it's pretty much anybody can be a roman if you if you want to be um so they're willing to bring in everybody so i get eventually like it starts off with people who were just born in rome but eventually if you're talented and you know if you're rich um then you can come in you can join in, you can get citizenship and bring your way in so people start uh becoming or getting involved in the aristocracy from slightly further out you get people from around italy who are brought in and then over time it becomes like over the whole empire like the uh some of the best emperors come from mm -hmm. spain they come from uh the dalmatian coast um so by having like that very um or being by very good at bringing people into a flagging system, it can survive a lot longer. So, um, like in the ancient world, you get those, I guess, different degrees, like Sparta's at one end of a very closed system that falls away quite sharply. Athens in the middle, and then Rome at the at the other end. You get a, a long-standing empire. Very interesting. Um, there's one thing. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Along this line that we're talking, uh, slavery is a is a almost every part of every history, slavery is a big factor, you know, and it's, it was part of Valeria to have slavery and in different ways, Rome and, and Athens, you know, or, or uh, Sparta, same thing. And it's, you know, there's no real easy or simple discussion about slavery. It's a tough, diverse topic integrated in almost every culture of all history. But part of the point I want to make is we have this certain, I, I say we probably like Americans have this certain vision of what slavery is. But at different times, at different places, it was defined in different ways, of different types or levels of slavery. And that was something that Rome and Sparta, a lot of these older countries had much more defined sort of caste systems. It wasn't just like white people have black slaves. It wasn't as simple as that. There were like slaves that were born into it, slaves that could, some slaves could like earn their freedom eventually. It was much more economic, uh, right? Were, like it had much more to do with with money. I thought, in my understanding, right? Like if you yeah, if you're broke, like, like well, I mean, it had a lot slavery. to do with money in America. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. But, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. But it, it, for example, it had a lot to do. A lot of times when you would conquer someone in a battle, you would take those people's slaves. Yeah, I just mean but I'm then, just agreeing with you about the racial element. It was a lot less. It wasn't as important. Oh well, yes, yes, yes. Um, there was certainly sort of exclusive exclusivity of your race or whatever. But it's it. Anyway, the point is that there was a more defined sort of system for progressing through levels of slavery and earning citizenship and such. And uh, that <clears throat> I think that Rome was a little bit more 
set up for people to move into citizenship than, well, Rome, Athens, other Roman, other city states than Sparta, who was like, no, you guys are slaves forever and we're <laughs> Spartans forever. And, and they were trying to main that, maintain that. And uh, shoot, I feel like I was bringing, I feel like I was going to tie this into something with Larry. I forgot what it was. But, Think uh, about it for a sec. I've got uh, one other question I can okay, ask yeah. while, you, while you try to remember. So Jamie, as far as, this would be something that I would say is a difference then between Rome and Valeria is Rome had this very, uh, open like you said spanish emperors arab emperors just all over it wasn't they didn't have big issues with race in terms of who was in charge uh, that which is why i brought up the money and power thing mm-hmm. that seems to be more what mattered and like it's a merit system i suppose you could say their version of merit now how does that that's very different i would suppose from valeria which was very like big on racial purity um or for not just race reasons because there's the magic aspect to this but because we hear that incest wasn't super common among the non dragon rider families. That was really just about that. So one question I wanted to ask is how much did incest play out in some of these ancient high born families? I know it wasn't a big deal as far, my understanding is it wasn't a thing as much of a thing in Rome, but it was say Ptolemy's Macedonia or Ptolemy's Egypt. It was, there was plenty of it. So I know there's, there's some of you. So what are maybe some other examples or just that that general topic I'm curious about, because that's obviously a connection to Valeria as well. <laughs> yeah, in in Rome, there's a there's a very different like understanding of incest compared to uh, the modern day. I think it was strictly along the paternal line was considered incest. Oh. And it was like so either I think your parents, your children your like uncles and aunts on the father's side and cousins on the father's side, but the mother's wasn't. Really? So you get a very, um, so sometimes some things that we'd consider incest, they wouldn't, but when there were things that they would consider incest, then that really crossed the line. Um, so it's the, pretty serious, huh? yeah, the emperor Claudius marrying his aunts Agrippina because that was on the father's side. So that drew heavy criticism oh. from uh, where they were basically shunned, aside from the fact that they were like emperor and empress, so they couldn't, but it was considered quite a scandalous at the time. Wow. Um, but anything else in Roman terms isn't isn't much of a big deal. Um, and then in Egypt, um, I mean, yeah, there's a long tradition of like uh, brothers marrying sisters. Oh, that goes pre that goes pre Macedonian influence. They yeah, they that's... sort of picked that up from the Egyptians. Yeah. Okay, I got that in reverse. I see. Okay, yeah. and it goes um, like all the way through society. Um, wow. So you'll often there are some papyri from sense. So Egypt's great for social history because there's a lot of documentation written in uh, I think like Greek and Coptic. So you learn a lot about Alexandria in like the around the time of like the turn of the from like BC to AD and you can chart families because they do these censuses every 10 years. And so you can see like, Oh, this is their family and these are their children. And here are the children slightly older. And they were the next one here, are the children all married to each other. And it's oh, just gosh. what happens. <laughs> it's, oh, you'll see like, there'll be like six children. And then at the next one, Oh, they're all paired off and married to each other. But it, it just happens. Wow. That is a way of like securing like the family possessions. Uh, that you don't want to let any of it get outside so um, or keep skills within the family. It sounds like, I think some people yeah. have the impression that George R. R. Martin like exaggerated this aspect of, <laughs> it's like, mm, well, the dragon part is fantastical, but there's a lot, there's a lot of incest there's in the ancient world. Incest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the taboos have changed over time. I mean, but it's not because the taboos did exist in some places. It's, it's strange how, I guess they just took hold in some places and others. And I guess, do you, do we, do you know, where where some of these taboos originate from isn't it just regular just noticing the 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 genetic the problems that come from it like the straight up physiology or is it does it there other ancient world knowledge that plays out in this pretty much there's very it's rare that incest is widespread you occasionally get it in ruling families to um like mainly for aspects of like where they're descended from the gods oh, um yeah. but you sometimes get aspects of that and you don't want to bring non-gods into it it's very similar uh, to the dragon rider stuff except it's yeah. not as straightforward not as provable <laughs> there's another just... sorry oh you go ahead 
I was gonna say like it's the same like basic idea of whatever gives me power, I'm not gonna share it. I'm descended from a god, I've got a dragon. You're not you can't have power because you don't have a dragon, you're not descended from a god. There's another factor that's maybe more simple than you realize it it's as much about just abusive relationships. Like oh, okay, uh yeah. it, it takes a while and especially when you go farther back in history when there was you know less uh uh conscious of a society you know when when people were more divided into tribes or whatever there wasn't histories and stuff it's really hard to understand or detect generational changes in genetics over time right yeah. that's it's hard it takes a long time to observe that people die before it comes to fruition and stuff but it's not hard to observe a father having sex with his own daughter is messed up does that make sense? Like, yeah. like a, pretty much every culture in any time with no knowledge or genetics is still going to recognize that's messed up. An older brother and his sister, that's messed up, right? Yeah. It's it's usually the incest that we're worried about is a really it's abusive situations, right? Mm -hmm. It's and Craster, so it's not right. Like a good, good example. Oh yeah, that's like a very extreme. How do they yeah. break out of that? But, like they're they're raised to believe this is how it is this is how it always is this is how it's always going to be like they don't yeah. even necessarily conceive of another lifestyle that could exist until they're you know a young adult or even later in some cases but so like cousins you know or or like you know maybe some distant you know someone who's your relative a cousin or even an uncle or an aunt or something but someone that isn't like doesn't have authority over you having a relationship with them isn't necessarily abusive, right? Someone who's your cousin, but they're in another town. You don't know, meet them until you're 20 and you fall in love. You don't even know if they're cousins or you see what I'm saying? Like you can see how you can have relationships that aren't necessarily wrong or bad or abusive, even if they're within a family. Mm -hmm. And we have come to learn that can cause trouble after generations, but anyone can see an older brother taking advantage of his younger sister. No, you're not allowed to do that. And communities and societies are going to try to stop that from happening, whether or not they know or understand anything about the genetic mutations that can occur. Mm -hmm. Well said. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about, uh, let's move on a little bit here. Let's talk about um, how the infighting, a little bit of how infighting goes with these situations. With these oligarchies, there's a, a lot of internal competition. And I suppose Jora Mormont said it well when... He said, it's, you know, the, the High Lords playing their Game of Thrones. That's going to happen. It's the common people just want to be left alone. In some ways, when the High Lords just go at it, it does kind of work that the people are left alone. It just depends on how hard they're going at it. <laughs> if they're bring, raising armies and going at it, that's terrible for the, the lowborn. But if they're just like assassinating each other, eh, it's not such a big deal to, to other people. You know, it doesn't have this huge spillover factor necessarily. It can because it can result in the change of leadership and that can have all sorts of a downstream effects. So that's something I want to talk about as, as well. How much do these ancient world oligarchies f stop each other from gaining power so that, in other words, they don't want one family to become so powerful that they become effectively a king or actually a king in some cases, or they, they get powerful enough to declare themselves emperor. How does that generally play out like on a day-to-day, week-to-week, maybe small-scale they team up on each, like one of them, a bunch of them will gang up on the powerful one or something like that. Like, how does it usually go? So there's a, a phase of Greek history called, like, I guess the origins of the, the tyrants and the tyrannicides, which is where you get over all of Greece and like the Greek world, um, all these oligarchies that eventually one family or one individual tries to think, right, okay, I want to take more power here. And how they always do it is by appealing to um, the masses. Like they say, right, mm. the rest of these oligarchs, they're all taking advantage of you. I won't let them do that. <laughs> We've seen that before. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> At that, least not for a while. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boy, that one is, that's, some things never change, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you get these, the tyrannies where they start popping up. Um, and a lot of the times these are quite popular. Um, so sometimes they'll um, enact like law codes that can be uh, like sort of uh, curb some of the abuses. And then what will usually happen is the first ruler is quite uh, popular and then they die. And it's what happens next. Oh, uh, my son, he will take control. And the son is a spoiled brat. Who, <laughs> he didn't live uh, through any of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who is 
a tyrant <laughs> and um then all the uh, aristocracy thinks right okay we can't do this anymore let's just get rid of them um so you have the tyrannicides who are like the assassins of the tyrants um and so it kind of goes around in circles of this like you'll have one family will break away they'll dominate for a generation and then it falls over in the second generation everyone or they get killed the oligarchy comes back and then i don't know maybe 30 40 years later the cycle repeats itself so you kind of go through these periods of dominance but uh, an oligarchy is generally bad at looking after itself that it, it will always do something that destabilizes the oligarchy either through putting one person in control or where the whole thing falls down and it becomes a democracy or something like that mm. is this number like 40 kind of a is that just something george probably made up or do we have is there other numbers that kind of get thrown around in the ancient world or is that kind of a difficult question i'm kind of just a random question that occurred to me not something i thought about in advance <laughs> there uh greek history in particular is full of like numbers where they like mm. to give numbers to every group of thing i think there's uh i think literally 30 tyrants the 30 tyrants. yeah a, that one just popped in my head too yeah 30 30 tyrants. Mm. yeah then then there are the um any group of government always gets a number like there's the the 100 the 600 the 3000 they okay, all yeah. all the assemblies however many people are in them they become that's the number mm. and then they're always referred to as the number so that's quite common so it kind of gets locked in for a little while but it's not it's not a literal yeah. number usually right like you said yeah right? it's okay yeah it, it varies over time so it's will be like uh yeah the 300 but there may not necessarily necessarily be 300 people in it hmm It'll, it'll change. So as far as wars, you mentioned we one of the most famous examples that I know of is, um, I almost said Craster again, I meant to say Crassus. <laughs> but he, who you used, you made an example of these families can just raise their own army and go out and do conquering. Like, that's just something they can do. They can choose to do that. And there's, you know, sometimes there's laws that say they can't do it. Like Julius Caesar's wars of aggression in Gaul were technically illegal, right? It didn't stop him, but mm -hmm. that's, what we're told so how does let's talk about that interplay a little bit from how it may have played out in valyria like if a valyrian conqueror wants to go out and attack uh, a city and take it over we know that happened a lot of times we know that a lot of their conquests worked like that it wasn't some nation or like the whole nation didn't organize to do this it was just a powerful group of valyrians that says hey let's go conquer a city establish ourselves there and We'll end up paying taxes back to the freehold, but that, you know, and, and that's how it would go. Is that a thing that existed in the ancient world too? Just powerful groups will come out and do that? I believe I heard this about like Theseus and ancient stories like that, that you could hear even that would happen in the pre, like super pre-ancient times. But I can't remember where I heard that. Maybe it was just a book that I read. Uh, that's what Julius Caesar did pretty much, right? Yeah, that is true. I mean, you're right. That, so I'm trying to get example? other examples and just like how this worked and the legality of it. And yeah, just talk to us about that for a minute. So you'd, you, the main reason you'd want conquest is because it elevates your own status within your city, within your state. So it's just how you go about it. Mm. And then that varies from place to place. Um, so, uh, I talk about Athens in the, the Peloponnesian War. Uh, one of my all time favorite people from history, um, uh, Alcibiades. Oh, yeah, I love that guy. Um, <laughs> he's, he's quite a character. <laughs> um, and he basically comes up with this harebrained scheme to go invade Sicily. He's like, you know what? It would be great if I was like the, the master of Sicily. I know what I'll do. I'll give a damn good speech in the assembly. And I'll convince everybody else that what we really need to do is invade Sicily. This is, by the and way, then, folks, this is while they're already at war with Sparta. This isn't just a peacetime. Yeah. They're already at war with Sparta, who's yeah. right there. And Sicily is pretty far from Athens. <laughs> and they've been at war with Sparta like 15 years. They're like, you know what? Let's take all our, all our armies and let's go invade Sicily. Um, and funnily enough, it doesn't work out. Does um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that kind of thing that you're able to just like convince everyone that what you really need to do is be put in charge of an army and you can go do it um in rome you'll have uh, i think there are many cases if you can where you'll build your political career off military victories so you'll kind of find ways to get involved in conflicts like um so you are governor in or 
in Rome for a year as a consul, and then you go off to be a governor in one of the provinces for a year as a proconsul. So one of the really plum gigs is to go to somewhere near an enemy and you can try and provoke a war. So that's exactly what Caesar does. Oh. He is elected as consul the next year. He's made a governor in the south of France, and he's able to provoke a war with some tribe and uses that as an an excuse to conquer the whole thing. Um, Pompey does the same thing. He's able to get a, a gig as the proconsul in Asia, and he uses that to conquer the whole of the East. Ooh. Crassus does it where he's like, oh, I'm going to be the proconsul of Syria, and then I'll find a way to start a war with Parthia. And then he, he goes off and uh, go dies in the and, desert. And inspires the Viserys getting gold poured on his head. Good job, Crassus. Yes. You, you, you directly influenced the Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm glad in modern there. times we've gotten... Time. I'm glad in modern times you've gotten past this idea of provoking war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good thing we got rid of that, yeah. yeah. Uh, so did this change in the imperial era for Rome? Was it different, the starting wars? Was it like more locked down? Was the, was the emperor more in control of the armies? Yeah, so what happens is during the Roman civil wars, Augustus realizes that, hey, maybe it's a bad idea to have lots of people controlling massive armies because they... <laughs> It's just generally really? a bad idea. Not an idea. So a good idea <laughs> would be if I owned all the armies because then no one could challenge me. <laughs> so he undergoes like um, I mean, first of all, he has to kill Mark Antony, so he does a good job of that. Then uh, when Mark Antony's dead, he's got most of the legions. He implements a series of reforms, and like how the Roman Empire is birthed is basically through a complicated series of governorships mm. that are personally attached to him. So it's like every region in the empire that happens to have a legion, I'm the governor of, so nobody else will have control of those legions. Nobody else can start a war. Wow. Um, and then that eventually becomes um, all tied together in a little package that they call like the the uh, Augustus, that that all gets attached to that title. And then you pass that on from to your successor. Um, and then one of his many names, Imperator, will eventually become emperor over time. And then that's how we get hmm. the notion of the empire. Hmm. So, like, yeah, the idea that you don't let anyone else do that because it's it will be not good for you if you have all the people with, in control of armies, which uh, I suppose is what the, yeah, the Targaryens try to do in, in Westeros. It's like, yeah, you know, no one else can do this they never pulled and, that off at valyria it remained a freehold yeah. till the end but you're right that's uh you're right the targaryens tried to it helps when you've got all the other dragon families dead yeah <laughs> <They're easy. laughs> talk about the only game in town yeah uh so that, that's really fascinating i wonder too so here's a, a question sort of segueing in, into our next subtopic the first valyrian wars with the Giscari, which as we have shown or have some nice parallels to the punic wars what um did the transition to imperial era from republic era did that how did that change slavery or did it did it increase their need for slaves or was it about the same because i know valyria as it expanded more it's its need for minerals and and just more laborers and, and quote unquote need desire for greed for you know want uh did how does that did that change or was it yeah just talk to me about that or talk to us about that it definitely changes um it yeah it changes in a few different ways so you've got the uh, one of the main uh i guess not the romans would say this themselves they'd say they were the the victims of a series of wars that gave them an empire but what happens is they go off they go and steal all the things from all their neighbors until they've got control of the whole mediterranean mm. And then there's a point at which they stop. And then all of a sudden, they're not going off. They're not winning wars. That supply of, of wealth and of slaves just kind of dries up. So it has a few different benefits, or not the benefits, uh, a few different effects. Completely <laughs> <laughs> wrong word there. Um, where there's um, like a change in slavery, where there's... Um, both in terms of like wealth extraction, the um, how that gets focused. Like um, you're using slaves in a more wealth intent, wealth generation intense way, and um, they 
get looked after better all of a sudden there aren't cheap slaves mm. coming in because there isn't a constant series of wars oh. so um the condition of slaves becomes good because you need to look after your slave because it's really expensive to go and buy another one the price goes up yeah supply and demand yeah. it's kind of awful to think about humans that way but that is that's accurate and then further down the line after you get about a century of this um they start to have uh like it, it, the situation gets um bad because when you've got an economy built on slaves and you're not getting slaves like you start to get problems so they'll invent wars specifically to go and get slaves so that's why um trajan invades uh Dacia, so like modern day romania um which is a really bad strategic idea when you've got like a nice border on the um on the danube to suddenly go and stick a province on the other side of it which is ve- really vulnerable to attack mm. um but they do it just because they need to get slaves um and then trajan goes off and he invades um persia um which uh, again doesn't go well and sort of sets off a series of civil wars that uh, re- nearly completely destabilized the empire in about the year 120. Um, so yeah, the empire starts to get desperate in its ways to try and get more slaves. Wow. So it's really, so there's a note I have later in the document that really appears to be relevant here, which is that they had to start wars, had to quote in, in quotes, uh, had to start wars to get more slaves to feed the the need that they had created for themselves. They're like, yep, well, we, mm-hmm. we've set up the system. It requires more bodies added to it constantly and we're running out of them so we have to go do more conquering so yeah it's really a system that feeds itself it's really a gross cycle of perpetuation there um, there's a lot of uh, arrogance involved in it too a lot of self-centeredness because I, I think it was even aristotle who who had this idea that like the the greeks were what everyone what the rest of the world is here for us no. like mm-hmm. We need all these other cultures to serve us. Uh, and uh, the Spartans, the same thing. There were laws against Spartans performing menial duties. They weren't allowed to be farmers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Only the slaves could do that. We, we, that's not our thing. We train. Know? We train for the next war yeah. <laughs> or scare people. So, Jamie, uh, yeah, t- yeah. talk about that for a minute. Actually, I'm curious about um, how the this would, would play out in, re- in regards to... Um, well, like you said, in terms of, of wealth generation, like you said, they they would rather than just service and basic needs like the farming that Sean talked about, <laughs> they started using them for like mining and things like that, which is just straightforward. You're spending bodies to get wealth out of the earth. And that's 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 what we think about with Valeria quite a lot. Surely the slaves were doing all sorts of things other as well. But this is one of the most like the one of the worst things to imagine as far as that that goes is. Um, does that resonate pretty similarly there as well? Yeah. Mm. What you end up with when you've got these sort of highly competitive oligarchies, um, which I mean, even in the imperial period, while the, the emperor is in control of everything politically, there's still like the social oligarchy mm. that's still competing for dominance. You still want to be the top family. And how can you be the top family by showing off how much money you've got? So you, you flaunt it. And so what happens <laughs> is <laughs> you've got all these families who are trying to be extravagant to show off how much money they've got. And they're spending it on luxury resources that are often, for, and what are luxury resources? They're things that you can't easily access. So for the Romans, it was things like spices, like silk that came from China, that came from asia that came from arabia so you've got this Mm. wealth drain that goes on over two or three hundred years where just gold is just sucked out of rome and works its way over to china like if you uh look in like chinese archaeological sites from the the han dynasty it's full of roman coins that it it all ends up there Mm. Um, (laughs) so the what the emperors do because they can see this is happening like the romans aren't generally good at economics but they can spot that all this gold is leaving (laughs) they start to implement um like laws prohibiting luxury that you're not allowed to 
he's so extravagant. You're not allowed to wear certain garments. You can't do things that cost too much money just because it's being spent away when the empire doesn't have that inbuilt wealth hmm. that it can generate without slaves. So I'd see you'd probably have a, a similar thing in the with the 40 families in Valeria that how are they going to compete with each other? They're going to be showing off that they're the most powerful, they're the wealthiest. And so they'll just like frisk through, through their resources mm. and they need more. So they need to go and get more from other people. Wow. And it's become this, this cycle. And when you don't have an emperor who can forbid it, who can put a stop to it, that's just going to carry on until... Yeah, that's something we made a big point about last time is how these families really have, there's no one keeping them in check unless they threaten the other family's power. Then they may team up on each other. But if they're just out there doing things like this, unless it makes them a threat to the others, then yeah, anything goes. Um, Sean? You know, you mentioned uh, Tywin, but didn't didn't someone tell Danny that Khal Drago was so wealthy that his slaves had golden collars? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Good catch. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. He was that's just good. so much conquering and destroying, and and the the, the, the Dothraki are interesting because they don't like they don't have these palatial estates to spend money on. Right, they're mostly just out in the field. <laughs> like he owned a manse in Pentos, but how often was he there? I mean, you know, he didn't like. <laughs> he's all he's mostly out on the Dothraki Sea. So, Sean, referring to your question about Aristotle, your point about Aristotle, here's another question I wanted to ask, something we have a lot of curiosity about. It's increasingly harder in the modern world, and it's a very good thing to justify wars of aggression. People still do it. It still happens, but it's harder and harder. Like, the world opinion is generally focused against the aggressor. That's a very good thing. In the ancient world, it's not nearly like that, but there still were the need for justification sometimes. They're just a lot looser, I guess it's fair to say. But was it like what Sean says about Aristotle or how they just see themselves as more important than everyone else? Or, or what kind of justification do they use? Or did they just not need justifications? Do they just say, eh, I'm better than you. I can do whatever I want. I kill you. I make I enslave you. That's the way of the world. Like, what's their philosophy or attitude? Or Well, sometimes they might have to justify it to their own people because they're going to take farmers away from the crops and Good young point. men Good are going to go die. So they have to have some amount of justification. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think most cultures generally like to regard themselves as the good guys Mm. and i think people will tend to do a lot to make sure that that's at least how things appear like even if they want um something that their neighbor has they'll work out a way in their own heads of like okay how can i justify this oh that that nate that other state offended me they they were rude to our diplomats that's just reason to go and kill them um, so you'll get things like that. Um, like that's how I think I mentioned earlier about Rome accidentally expanding. That <laughs> if you look at Roman history, that's how they treat it. It's like a series of Oops. accidents that gave them an <laughs> conquered our neighbor. Oops, conquered the new neighbor. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like that. There are things like oh, we, we they need to protect the uh, the salt pans at the mouth of the Tiber. Um, so there's a nearby city called Vio, um, and it's like oh, they threaten our access to salt without salt like we won't be able to feed ourselves like we we need this it's we will be destroyed if we don't go and destroy this threat to the salt fields Mm -hmm. so there's a war with va they they take them out and then oh look we've got this new city and we've got these salt fields and then it'll work its way up to eventually um really complicated sets of ways to justify that they're actually the victims here like um where like how the Punic Wars break out is an absolute joke. That's the, a great um, segue. Let's we were I wanted to go to that next. Yeah. So let's do it. Yeah. Tell us about that. So the there are a group of renegade mercenaries called the Mamertines who seize a city in Sicily. Um then Carthage, which is the power in Sicily, um, along with the city of Syracuse. Um, is like, hey, that's not good. Uh, we're gonna kick you out. <laughs> and then you these um, <laughs> these renegade mercenaries who happen to be Italian, uh, they appeal to Rome and they say, hey, we're we're Roman. These these Carthaginians they're trying to kick us. You should come protect us. You're we're we're the same. You and I. And then Rome's like, yep, that's a good thing. We'll come <laughs> and protect you. Let's let's go invade Sicily <laughs> to help help our own. 
and then that sparks like a 120 year long conflict with Carthage. Yeah, I remember reading about the Mamertines. Didn't they just basically they took the whole city over and they killed all the the, the men and just took every mercenary got a new family, got to take the family. They chose families yeah, of the men not. they killed and like, I'm your new dad. I'm your new husband, <laughs> and this is my house now. Like, it's like a it's like a sitcom where the actor changes, the dad actor <laughs> no, just man. changes all of a sudden. Except it's far more I violent. I was gonna say it's like a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Well, yeah. It's it's a horror a horror sitcom. Fine line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, well, like Wandavision, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's let's have a quote. Um, wars with the Giscari, typical George fashion. Three Punic Wars. Five wars between Valyria and <laughs> the Iskar. He likes to turn it up a notch. <laughs> Let's have the quote. The five great wars between the freehold of Olgis when the world was young are the stuff of legend. Conflagrations that ended each time and the victory of the Valerians over the Giscari. It was during the fifth and final war that the freehold chose to make sure there would be no sixth war. The ancient brick walls of Olgis, first raised by Grasden the Great in ancient days, were raised. Raised by race. Yeah, they were raised and then <laughs> raised. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that's hilarious. And it's like, no, that's the opposite thing. <laughs> that's hilarious. George, he's he's sneaky like that. So this is one, there's a lot of things about old gifts, both large and small, that remind me of Carthage. Let's talk about that for a minute since we've spent a lot of time on Rome and, and uh, Valyria before we come back to that. For example, when you're reading about Carthage, there's like five names. <laughs> It's like Hanno, Hannibal, Hamilcar, Mago, and like Himilco. And then and they, these names just repeat over and over. There's, there's so much confusion about, was that the same Himilco or the same Hamilcar or the same? Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a bajillion Grazdans <laughs> in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the Giscari uh, empire. So that's a small comparison. But other than that, yeah, Carthage was older than than Rome. Uh, the Punic people, the Phoenicians, Punic Phoenician, that's where that comes from, is older than Rome. And and but the freehold Valyria overtook Greece, just like the Valyrians overtook Carthage. And this bit about the, how it ended, that's pretty similar too, right? The third war was just the third Punic war was just like, nah, we're not doing this again. We're making sure this is the last one. Is that that's so that's pretty similar, huh? Yep, three times is enough. Can't be doing this again. Don't want to go to Africa one more time. <laughs> Let's just burn down the city. Yeah, just and took the walls you know, down, right? That was a part of it, right? They destroyed the walls and yeah. yeah. Hmm. There wasn't another war, but the city of Carthage did rise again to be a prominent, like one of the it's most a prominent great cities spot, in the Mediterranean. Right? It's just a great yeah, location. Yeah. You can't change that. <laughs> Unless there's a volcanic eruption that destroys the whole, <laughs> you know. <I> <laughs> Right, so that's why. Am I right? That's just the spot's just really good, right? Yeah, perfect spot between East and West Mediterranean. I mean, yeah, Tunis still massive port there. Yeah, still today, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. this this story that's also um, kind of similar, and with the Valerians and the Giscari, we don't get a lot of details about how these wars went, other than it was the freehold always won. Um, there's the Punic Wars are pretty well documented, though, as far as the real world goes. And but they had a really wide theater. That's why this comparing Slavers Bay to the Mediterranean was something I wanted to, to lay the groundwork for, because, yeah, they're fighting all over. They're not just like striking at each other's capitals. Like in the Second Punic War, fighting over Spain was where it started. The Carthaginians invaded Spain, which used to be theirs, and they wanted to take it back. And that was really important because there's lots of silver mines there. So there's a lot of wealth. So like whichever side controlled the silver mines gets a bit of an edge. And of course, it's across the water. So they would have a land route. To Italy, it's pretty far, but you know, it's they don't have to cross over by ship, so that's you know, there's strategic value to that. So, for example, in uh, in Martin World, in the third Giscari Valyrian War, there was they fought in the Basilisk Isles, which is like interesting, right? They they were fighting over these small islands. There was the uh, Gorgai, which was founded by Giscari people, and then it was captured and renamed Gogassos. We've got a whole bonus episode on that one. That's pretty cool. It's a city of blood magic. It was almost the 10th free city. It's very uh, creepy and cool. And in the fourth Giscari Valerian War, they, they fought over Zamatar. Zamatar was a Giscari colony that the Valerians conquered and took over. And that's mainland Sathorios. So, like, they're fighting over mainland Sathorios. Now, this to me is very similar to what they're doing with the mines, which is 
there's a lot of wealth in Sothorios, but it's deadly. Well, perfect situation to send your hapless slaves into. Well, I don't, they don't care what happens to the slaves. If they send in 10 slaves and those ten sla- nine of those slaves die, but that one slave comes out with just the pounds of gold and gems, they're going to call that a win, as gross as it is. You know, it doesn't take, it's hard, not hard to understand that. So pretty bad. Um, so, but you also see why they're fighting over all these different places everywhere throughout the, the theater of war, because there's wealth and, and value that's pooling, creating armies or creating uh, things that are arrayed against the other nation. So let's talk about that briefly, Jamie. What was about the, the expansion? It's almost like a, a world, ancient world war where the, the wo- world is the Mediterranean world and it's basically being fought kind of all over. Is that, is that pretty accurate or was that just maybe more the Second Punic War or, or is it kind of both of them? Or just talk about that for a bit. The first two are quite massive and the second one is bigger than the first but they're all quite large um like nothing the western mediterranean had ever seen before Mm. you don't have armies this large fleets this large fighting over such a wide geographical area i mean for the like in the second punic war in particular when both carthage and rome are going hell to leather it is a a war of like where the other side needs to put its dominance on that half of the Mediterranean, the other the side that wins is going to get it. Mm. That you've got that uh, like similarity there, where um, I think when you talk about the different geographical areas um, for like the the commerce, like I think to go way back to the beginning when I was talking about the Iscari being a bit like the Phoenicians, um, I was kind of getting at like the importance of trading posts. Like it's a very widespread empire, but it's not land-based it's more like a series of interconnected ports that are um yeah so like quite commerce based um and they need access to that like that's how the empire is going to function like through the these things they need to be connected and then if you're going to defeat them what you need to do is cut off these separate entities from each other and a lot of the second punic war is rome trying to do that um with uh, against carthage um how it ultimately succeeds is when it can finally cut off um hannibal in italy from his reinforcements Mm. in spain and the potential reinforcements in africa like that ability to get control of the the trade routes of being able to move different forces between them like that's what they need Uh. to do to win Valeria would have a so, huge uh, edge there with the dragons being able to control the seas and all that. That would be just a huge, huge advantage. Yeah, if you're able to cut off a colony by itself, it's just going to die rather than like a stronghold that can be easily reinforced. It's like a completely different proposition. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so... Hannibal did, by the way, he, he basically held Italy for like a generation. Was right? it like, how like, long was he in it? Like 15 years or something like that? Or Yeah. About 15 years yeah. of him just uh, marching around Italy. That was a one of the bits that made me fall in love with the Punic Wars and why I wanted to tell that story in my show is the is Livy, who tells the story in so much detail, and he does like a blow-by-blow account of each year what happened. So you've got um, Hannibal going around like, after the initial battles where he just trounces the Romans, destroys the, the legions at Lake Trasimene at Cannae. Um, then you've got Hannibal going around taking cities from Rome and then Rome just kind of falls around and takes it back like <laughs> weeks later. Like and then game. that just kind of plays out really slowly over about 15 years. And all the while he's trying to get reinforcements and then the Carthage is like well, this is an example of the oligarchy family's not yeah. like infighting like they're not doing what's best for the nation they're doing what's best for them they wouldn't send him reinforcements because they were afraid of the barca family becoming like the dom the do- like become making themselves kings or something like that is that pretty is that pretty accurate yeah yeah they don't want hannibal to be all powerful if he's the the conqueror of the western mediterranean what are they they'd, they'd rather be a big fish in a small pond than a subjects that, that really blew up in their faces didn't it <laughs> next thing they know <laughs> hannibal's bringing his army back to defend the homeland and then losing because he's outclassed and outnumbered and then the city is destroyed <laughs> yeah pretty bad Gosh, they go. 
the lender s yeah carthus must be destroyed yeah so that was that was how the third one started right there was this, a certain roman senator that just constant ended every speech with oh carth and by the way carthage must be destroyed like he could be talking about like trade routes to syria and he's like by the way also carthage must be destroyed <laughs> every for about 30 years or so case the case the elder he's just every speech yeah. finishes yep and the carthage must be destroyed you can imagine some valerian like high boring guy like getting up and just doing the same things by the way you know let's let's go attack uh the sarnori people you know they've got some loot there we all we all want that and they're a threat to us <laughs> old kiss must be destroyed yeah, yeah. old kiss carthage uh Astapor must be destroyed. <laughs> Old Gist must be the the Great Pyramid must be shattered. All right, let's take the next quote here that describes a bit more of what was happening in these wars. Was a little bit of fun detail, fun slash awful. <laughs> 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 in the second and third Giscari Wars, the tall men took up their swords as allies of Valyria. In the fourth war, rival kings took opposite sides, some joining the Giscari and others the Valyrians. Lomas Longstrider wrote of a fallen obelisk carved about with the figures of Gis's allies in that fourth war, and noted that the tallest warriors depicted, made taller by high helms, were the Sarnori. The obelisk was raised by Gis, but the carvings were Valyrian, for all the warriors were captured and enslaved. Now, this is this is allows us to talk about several things. The first one I'd like to point to or, or describe, get into, uh, is that when you have a sort of a global world war, Mediterranean world war scenario, it's hard for anyone to remain neutral. That's one of the, like, the big powers start to, like, bully people into taking sides of course they want them to take their side it's very hard to remain neutral and i i think that would be true in the in the world of essos as well where in this example the sarnori it, it shows that in different wars they were on opposite sides and two of them they were on the side of valyria and in one side they were on the giscari but some of the sarnori city states took the other side so sarnor wasn't some united nation either and we see that with greece sometimes they took like we saw greek city states taking the side of the persians at some points uh partly because of bribery and a promise not to be annihilated but you know there's still it happens and that's probably the case here too i imagine some of these sarnori kings weren't just like jumping to take a side they were probably like let's see what we can get out of this let's see which side offers us a little inducement to take their side it's more of an opportunity than uh, uh we need to get involved in this war for justice no they they see it as a, a profit or mar uh, thing or uh if we we do or we or, or rome or slash valeria is going to be mad at us that, that we weren't on their side so what are is that how does that kind of play out in the ancient world with these smaller nations or or in the case of carthage and rome were, were there even these smaller nations were they kind of relevant even at this time so arguably that kind of decided the war i'd say like um so you've got in the interior of africa in like modern day algeria uh numidia um which mm. is famed for its cavalry it has the best cavalry in the uh, mediterranean and they start off because they're next to carthage so they're on carthage's side because they've got to be um, and then it goes through until eventually the Romans are able to convince um, the king of the uh, Numidian or a potential king of the Numidians that if they support his claim to the throne, if he wins, then they'll join his side. And that's uh, Massinissa. And then when he does that, and he does eventually switch sides, the he brings over the Numidian cavalry to the Roman side. Um, and because the Romans have terrible cavalry, they are awful at it. So that's partly how Hannibal does so well is because he's able to um, use his infantry to pin down the Roman line and then send his cavalry around the back. But when the Romans finally have a cavalry that can match the Carthaginian cavalry, then they're able to win, which is what um, eventually wins them the war at Zama. Mm. So that by being able to convince someone who was subordinate to your uh, enemy and convince them to join their side uh, that is like what wins them the war and then you've got something like Carthage's attempt to do that where they form an alliance with Macedon um, where they try and bring the uh, Macedonia over to invade Italy mm. uh, the Romans set up like win like or they form a deal with a load of Greek states who are hostile to 
Macedon, and then there's like a war in Greece, which is essentially a, a way to keep Macedonia out of the main Punic War. Um, and they eventually do that. They uh, cause enough of a trouble that the Macedonians can never send their army over to go help Hannibal out. Mm. Um, so they're very, very important, even though they work in like slightly different ways. Like a lot of it is just domineering. There's not really much of a like what you'd see in the modern world wars where it's like almost equal powers cooperating towards a common goal it's like a a bit more cold warish like whatever oh. superpower and bring their small estates and cajole them onto their side okay i love the modern parallels It really helps understand it we've got ancient world we got modern world we got martin world it's like a triangle it's a pyramid <laughs> we're about to talk about the great <laughs> pyramids too <laughs> it's a pyramid scheme <laughs> so can I, I yeah go ahead Sean another little piece of Sparta here I want to bring up is that early on generally speaking Sparta was kind of isolationist oh yeah they they their strong military might was just to keep their slave population in control they didn't want to go out and attack other people but when they did well guess what that some of their people <laughs> they start dying they're spread thin their whole empire falls apart but but I, I, I partly bring this up because, yeah, they were, they were trying to be neutral. You know what I mean? Like some some nations in these conflicts did try to be neutrals. Let's talk about this mm -hmm. this aspect of, of trophies, the obelisk and the, the carvings, the Valyrian carvings and showing the depictions of de defeat and and, we, and, uh, and all that. Nina writes that, that mention of a fallen obelisk carved with the defeated Giscari allies seems like another reference to Rome, pulling inspiration from triumph for, triumphal victory columns like Trajan's and Marcus Aurelius. It seems like that's a a somewhat standard thing across a lot of cultures to erect victory monuments or statues or something like that. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. There was a literal obelisk that uh, Augustus took when he defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra oh. after they conquered Egypt. And they took that obelisk and erected it in Rome. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a definite Roman thing doing that. Um, and then, yeah, you put up a, big monuments with all the wealth that you've got and you decorate them with scenes of battles with descriptions of what a great guy you are and how <laughs> horrible the enemy are <laughs> yeah one of the maybe a possible martin world world wonder uh, could have been lomas longstrider only who you know is the guy that designated what was and what wasn't a world wonder got to visit the great pyramid of old gis after it had been destroyed so had it been whole he may have nominated it as such because he he saw the base of it was like oh my god this is gigantic but you know there was not wasn't much else left but that leads us to this this great quote of uh this great quote of devastation and death and <laughs> about what the Valyrians did to the Giscari when they were like, we're making sure you don't rise again. This is, this is going to sound familiar to some of y'all. The colossal pyramids and temples and homes were given over to dragon flame. The fields were sown with salt, lime, and skulls. Many of the Giscari were slain and still others were enslaved and died laboring and for laboring for their conquerors. Thus the Giscari came but another part of the new Valerian Empire. And in time, they forgot the tongue that Grisdan spoke, learning instead High Valerian. So do empires and others arise. So do empires end and others arise. So do. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've, yeah, I have read similar stories about how Rome finished off cards. We've all heard that salt, sowing the salt into the fields. That's probably, that probably didn't happen though, did it? Like salt, as you said before, yeah. salt was like a, an important resource. You don't just throw that away. Yeah, I think that's pretty much considered a myth at this point. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, but the rest—they might have done it symbolically over like some small portion of land. But yeah, the rest of it's pretty pretty accurate, though. I guess um, something like that. Like they were pretty thorough with their devastation of, of it all. I would guess. Oh yeah, you want to make sure that they after you've gone to that much trouble, that many wars. There's a, a point at which you want to make sure that they they can't do that again, um, and then the integration of its side i think that's that speaks for i like the use of the the, the tongue that language mm. is like one of the most powerful ways to like impose dominance um like that's arguably one of the reasons for the success of the roman empire mm. is like how successfully they spread um latin as the language that the western mediterranean uses mm. i mean greek still used a lot in the east but 
um when you look at like uh the native languages spoken by like the the celts and the iberians they just disappear like we don't really know what they are anymore it's just wow. um like latin is the root of french uh same spanish italian like all the other languages just get lost along the way mm. and that that's how it translates into like the culture of today is like through that through the language mm. um so if you want to and uh, from saying earlier about the spanish emperors that they consider themselves romans they don't consider themselves spaniards and part of it is that they've grown up speaking latin they just consider themselves latin so if you want to dominate your opposition you make them speak your speak your language they'll eventually start thinking like you like think that they're part of you and then that's how you yeah get a a, a stable empire mm. out of it so as we talked about last time one of the keys to valerian supremacy is quite obviously dragons and we we've, we've seen uh, we talked a little bit how those dragons got used and what we find is given their attitude towards human life which is very cynical and, and wasteful and awful they're not even the slightest chance of risk to a dragon generally means they'd rather just lose some some foot soldiers so because the dragons are the source of their power they're reluctant to use them so i think that is something that you have to keep in mind when we're conceiving or imagining these valyrian wars is that nina says here what i find really interesting is that there were at least some major valyrian losses if his dar's tapestry of a, of a v defeated valyrian army being dragged off into slavery by the giscari victors can be believed even though it seems like the valyrians had dragons from their earliest times and certainly by the fifth giscari war dragons were certainly not not an automatic win button the valyrians were not the guaranteed victors in this conflict and yeah and, and as i was saying they're not always even involved in some of these wars like or some of these individual battles because the, the you know the dragon lords are doing their own thing they're not necessarily on the same page they've got their own goals that's their their bottom line their greed their ambition is what they're worried about they're not worried about like the success of the nation you know unless it hurts them yeah, i guess sometimes it was also like a have your cake and eat it too situation and yeah. they can't have their dragon and use it too yeah mm, valerian <laughs> cake mm. <laughs> this is this idea is one part of why i was thinking so much about <laughs> Valerian cakes. <laughs> That's why I think it's so Volcano much cake, Sparta. for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lava cake. <laughs> it's why I think it's so much about Sparta that, that they had this very powerful, dominant, superior military might, but they weren't going out and attacking other people. And that seems to be the case with Valeria. Now, early on, Valeria, I, so I thought was that maybe like early on, Valeria didn't have as many dragons. And they needed all they had to just maintain this slave state that they had created. But over time, as the dragons get bigger and populate, now they can look to expand more. Maybe the, the core ideals of early Valerian leaders started to become more ambitious and they wanted to go out and attack more, some combination. But early on, Valeria didn't have slaves. So I don't know. Maybe it yeah. doesn't totally add up. It, or uh, maybe they didn't have it to this degree. Maybe it was like a proto version. Maybe they had like a thraldom kind of, I don't know. Who knows? It's, it's, you're right. It's not clear. But it does. T we are told in the world of ice and fire that they learned, quote unquote, learned slavery from the Giscari. What I, 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 there's a lot of ways to interpret that. I suppose one may be like they learned the intricacies of it, which is such a gross subject. But like the way that you can really manipulate people. They learned like the long term, the things that the Giscari learned about how to mistreat people and how to like get the desired result from human slaves. That's the kind of thing I think of because I think they weren't, I don't think the concept was completely foreign to them. Maybe it was, maybe like the idea, it just seems like such a natural idea. It's unlikely to me. And yeah, like it seems like there's too many parallels in Martin's world to the real world. And there's been slavery in every culture for all of history. Yeah, you know what I mean? Much, yeah. it's, and, and like Native Americans, had slavery they didn't learn it from europeans you right, know like right. it was it was arising everywhere through time through all geographic and, and it's a wide term too it's a very broad term uh, as you as you know yeah. there's, a, there's a difference between like slavery and a slave economy mm. and i think it might be oh yes economy. yeah there you go yeah okay but, it te but you can have slaves but having a whole economic system geared around slavery is quite something different right yeah okay. maybe the valerians had slaves from you know like some skirmish or people punished for some crime Dead slaves were put or into slavery. but the idea that you could like amass huge amounts of slaves and create a, a factory or a quarry around that you know the work that you wouldn't have even attempted because you didn't have the right labor for it, now you can. Yeah, and you and wouldn't have- That's what they learned from Giscard. And from an internal system, you wouldn't just all of a sudden have 100,000 new captives that are made into slaves all at once. That wouldn't happen. 
unless you're going out into the world and taking whole nations or whatever. And that, that happened yeah. with Rome and these other places a lot. Like all of a sudden there'd be this massive influx. Um, yeah. You need to like the, the way to like, for like capturing the slaves in the first place, transporting them. Then once you've got them, what, where do you put them? They need to be like clothed, fed, like put in houses, like where do they go? If they're going to work on big projects, there needs to be like infrastructure around that, around the mines, there need to be mining towns. Like, that takes so much time and thought to implement that. Like it's like quite a conscious decision doing all of that. Right on. You know, uh, here's another swirl of thoughts in my brain right now. In in America, when the cotton gin was invented, it was so efficient at separating the cotton, it made it more worth farming more cotton, which meant they needed more slaves, right? So this new technology, this new need, uh, this new demand caused a, a in one area caused more demand for slaves. I wonder if something happened in Valeria to create a new demand for slaves. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. they, needed, even speculated, they needed to create more Valyrian steel. They need it for with blood yeah, sacrifice. Yeah. The metals, I think that's uh, a big one, yeah. yeah. Or if maybe it's something I've been speculating is that maybe they found out that a volcano was going to explode or some way to control volcanoes through mines. If they had some combination of engineering oh. and magic to go divert lava mm-hmm. flow to stop a massive eruption, but they needed a bunch of slaves because it's very do dangerous. It. They don't want to send their own citizens yeah. in there, but oh. they don't have enough of their own citizens. All right. So we need to go get some more slaves to keep the world from blowing up. Wow. Here. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. So actually, let's take our, our mid roll break real quick, because that is pretty that we're, we're sort of drifting into the subject that we're starting right after the mid roll break. So let's let's pause, do that. And we'll come back to it. It's a really good start to that topic. Uh, first point we have uh, from here be dragons. Aziz is a veteran of the Punic Wars. That is true. I am a grizzled <laughs> veteran of the Punic Wars. Very nice. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> yes, and you too, Stephen. You you get uh, you've been promoted. You are you're now Field Marshal <laughs> Stephen. Uh, yes. So Stephen, of course, is the host of Here Be Dragons, where Sean is going to be doing a double duty live stream right after this. Head over to Here Be Dragons to to hear Sean talk about all his nerdy lifestyle stuff that we all appreciate that and have uh would like to hear about tony sled sends a super chat and says valerian expansion seems to be based on political clashes within their culture we are not privy to and it seems like they fought amongst themselves oh yeah for sure that's a that's a great point lots of political clashes that's part of why that's part of the the system that like the imperial system would would cut back on but a system like this without some leader above them yeah there's no one to stop them from infighting no one's strong enough to stop them other than each other so yeah, I think that's very true. Would you would you agree with that, Jamie? What Tony's saying here? Yeah, definitely. Right on. I think you've got that. Uh, yeah, it is going to drive things. That competition mm-hmm. just drives everything. So let's see here. We have from J.S. Holgerson. We have a recurring request from the fans. Whenever we have a guest on, they want y'all to say Irish wristwatch three times fast. So Jamie. Step up to the plate. <laughs> what? Well, uh, Irish wish for... Uh, I could have said one. <laughs> you didn't okay. get through it once. I'm going to try again. Yes, try again. again. You underestimated the difficulty level. <laughs> Irish wish for... <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. Irish wish for... Irish wish for... You've broken me. Wow, we've really stumped him. We got him. We got him. We broke our guest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we <laughs> He made his attempt. <laughs> okay, so, Sean, you had a few items from last week that you wanted to refer to, like a little follow-up. So let's do that real quick before we move back to our main oh, yeah. topic. One was, I thought, a very, uh, you know, a humorous thought that someone had in the, in the chat on our last video, uh, Feral75, I want to give credit. What is a, a group or a gathering or a collection of dragons called? Like you, you know, like a herd of cattle or a murder of crows or a flock of. It's geese. obviously a dance of dragons. A dance. <laughs> oh, a dance of dragons. Oh, there nice. you go. Shea nails it. Yeah. Wow, that's gonna be hard to top. A dance of dragons. Yeah. <laughs> well, he uh, Feral seventy five said, "Yeah, Inferno of dragons, darkness of dragons." That's pretty good. I volcano like of dragons. A volcano of dragons. <laughs> a maw of dragons. Yeah, folks, if you've got an idea, send it. Put it in the 
chat or, or tweeted at us or whatever you got. Yeah, that, we're we're curious to hear your group word for dragons. What's the best collection of dragons name? <laughs> Another thing I wanted to clarify, last week I said that aluminum was the most common element. I meant to say the most common metal. Oh, okay. It's the most common metal on Earth. And I should, as long as I'm clarifying, on when I say on Earth, I mean on the crust of Earth. It's, the I think, the maybe the third most element. The third most common element on the crust is aluminum. Oxygen is number one. It's uh, Aluminum is like seventh most all over on like a whole planet. Oxygen is number one overall. But mm. aluminum is the most common metal. Cool. On the crust of the earth. All right. Good to know. All right, let's talk a little more about the uh, comparing different types of slavery here and ask some specific questions. Start off with a brief two sentence quote, Sean. The Valerians learned one deplorable thing from the from the Giscari slavery. The Giscari who they conquered were the first to be thus enslaved, but not the last. So it, may, it certainly makes it sound like they're the first uh, foreign people they enslaved, as we speculated. Maybe they had some internal system for their own people but that's that's just guesswork now we see some in a song of ice and fire some of the portrayals we see of slavery whether it's in volantis where you have a full-blown slave economy where the slaves vastly outnumber the citizens which is you know something that all, uh, is accurate to a few places in the real world in ancient times um things like basic stuff like rank and file jobs laboring that's all very straightforward but um, there's a few other examples that we see portrayed that I wonder we want to talk about how they play out in the real world. For example, like tattoos and Volantis slaves are marked with a tattoo to indicate their specific job. Is that is tattooing slaves? Is that a ancient world thing? And it, did it work similarly or were there other purposes to it? Was it like a was it like an ownership thing or was there something else to it? So in certain circumstances, you'd get it uh, like to mark ownership um or as runaway slaves um but the it's less common uh, like particularly in the the roman world mainly because of the um the expectation that there are ways out of slavery and once you're out of slavery you're not a slave anymore like the stigma goes away from it um that, that transition of legal status like it's a lot less permanent in a way that tattoos aren't um, well, obviously. So um, you have that um, the, the idea that you'll always move away from it. Like there's not a, a permanence to it. I'm just kind of repeating myself now as well. Stop. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me let me ask this one then. It says a similar question then. Examples of the example we just gave, like Volantis, where there's more slaves than people. Is that was there a lot of other ancient world examples like that, or was that uncommon? Did Rome eventually get to that point itself, the city of Rome, or or not quite that far? The city of Rome got close, probably about half wow. slave. Okay. Um, Athens was the main one from the um, of the ancient world. I'd say there's a, a figure I think in Herodotus. No, no, it's from a legal source, um, Lysias, that's it, um, where he talks about the population breakdown of Athens, and it's that there were 10,000 free citizens. Um, so that is Athenians who are, they have citizenship, they own land. Then you have 30,000 metics who are non-natives, they're like um, foreigners who are living in Athens. Um, and then you have 250,000 slaves. Um, oh yeah, so massive uh difference there that nice democracy Athens, they had there <laughs> yep <laughs> pinnacle of democracy in the ancient world for you. and that, that would have it's worth uh, noting that would have varied through time like sure, at one yeah. point athens was only 30 percent slaves and i don't know so he, my guess is the percent probably grew and grew and did not shrink but, so that's probably the peak yeah, that, you're, so you're referring to there jamie the, the that 250k about 420 bc oh. so um heights of classical athens okay yeah and and i i'm sure the different city states had different structures and i i'm not an expert on any of them but i am just aware that sparta and athens and a lot of the cities had tiers of of slavery kind of like you were saying there's mm -hmm. there were even within those ones you said I, I know a little bit less of athens at that moment but there would be like someone who was born a free athenian to someone who owned land right that's like the highest level that you could get at then someone who was born to a free athenian but or 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 spartan or whoever but they didn't own land then someone who was born to 
uh, so a former slave that had earned their freedom, then someone who's born to a slave. These are all different levels who would have different levels of rights and access and, and social value and all and that. So yeah, on. like the yeah. way they be treated yeah. for their background. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Everyone's yeah, very big on that. I think they have like yeah, different tiers for like how old you were when you became free. Um, and something called like Julian citizenship, which is like a half citizenship where you have some rights, but not all of them. Mm. And then you have that for a certain time. And then your children will, pro depending on when you were made free, will get certain rights. Mm. And some slaves yeah. would be educated. They might be put oh, in yeah. charge of an estate. Some slaves would be sent to the mines and whipped. You know, it would be like a range of how they were treated and where they were put. And that, so. That's a great segue. I wanted to bring that subject up. Like, yeah, you have like very highly educated you know, slaves that, that were teaching the Roman kids, like patricians, children, uh, they were tutors or like, like, uh, wasn't, um, Plato enslaved for a while or is that so. not, Plato, not Plato, but they were like very like high educated. Okay. Um, not Plato specifically. I'm thinking of someone else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, like big names, sometimes like they spent time in slavery like that and that's, they weren't usually a big name like that is an example. Someone who goes to the mines, they get, they, they're, Re, re, uh, you know, used for their knowledge. You know, now we have a gap year. They had a slave year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, George addresses this too, right? That's the dilemma for Danny. That some of the slaves that she's freed, they had sort of like jobs and 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 prestige, even that she has disrupted. And uh, it's it's not as black and white, yeah. you know, as all slaves are terribly suffering. And and they when you free them, they suddenly became happy and wealthy. You know, some of them, it's not that their lot in life did decline, actually decline is, is tough to suss out or intuit that it's uh, it is true, especially if you're like yeah. really an old an older person. Now you don't have a house anymore. You know where to live. I mean, yeah, that is. Yeah, it's it's part of the the whole conundrum with breaking an existing system is there's just yeah, you can't you can't get around the collateral damage, I suppose. This is a little bit of a, a tangent, but still in this realm. Adam Smith believed that free nations would never free their slaves because they wouldn't punish themselves. The, the, you know, oh. they, they weren't really free. And these people who were thinking of themselves as being, you know, freedom lovers, but own slaves, they would never punish themselves for owning the slaves. And he thought that only a central government, a king, someone with or, or the pope, someone with authority could that could force and punish people who were doing a wrong thing would end slavery. That's kind of true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he had some points. It took war, you know, in America. I mean, think about like yeah. all the different ways slavery has been stopped around the world. It's usually like yeah, someone, some, some powerful person or group of people had to like really put the hammer down. It didn't just kind of mm -hmm. stop on its own. Um, so Nina supplies perhaps one of the greatest real world examples of slave population outnumbering, at least in a more modern example, which is Haiti pre-revolution Haiti, where 90% of the population was enslaved. And as Jamie said, Athens, up to 250,000 slaves. So those are examples of uh, very different sized nations. Like obviously Rome, Athens, huge. Well, Athens wasn't huge, but its, it's reach was huge, especially at its height. It was mm -hmm. controlling. It was relatively huge for that time. Of yeah, it had history. a maritime yeah. hegemony of sorts. Yeah. Um, and they were doing some pretty awful stuff with that. But uh, yeah, but um, Haiti is off, very awful, but it was a, a, an aspect of the French uh, hegemony or control from far away. And uh, that's a whole subject. I recommend um, Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast for more on that one. Um, but let's talk about slave soldiers. That's a particularly relevant one for uh, Song of Ice and Fire. The Unsullied are a good example of George turning up the dial on real world slave armies, making these guys just ridiculously amazing. It throws a little magic in there with the the wine of of courage, which is uh, isn't explicitly magic in the setting, but I don't think there's anything like it in the real world. I guess actually, I guess you could say that certain drugs and there are like child soldiers are given like heroin or whatever to make them or PCP to make them crazy. It's not the same thing, but I guess there is an example. So yeah, there uh, are examples of soldiers being drugged. Yeah. Slave soldiers. The Germans, the Nazis blitzkrieging across were almost certainly on some sort of methamphetamine. Yeah. Right. And, and even Hitler was taking s speed injections, apparently. Yeah. I mean, not for going into battle, but still just to, you know, focus or what have you. 
So let's talk about that. Uh, the first examples we have listed here for real world are the, the Janissaries and the Mameluks. Now, let's start off with, Jamie, you can maybe quickly describe what those are. Um, I, I know of them only a little bit. I know they're both slave armies from different nations and um, raised as children to be slave soldiers. Yeah, so the Mameluks are a uh mainly uh, the most famous in like later medieval egypt as a group of uh i guess like children were taken from modern day southern russia the caucasus um they're enslaved they're taken through to um egypt and then they're brought up as like their own separate uh like society within egypt as initially like the, the soldiers to protect the the sultan and then eventually they get rid of the sultan and take control of egypt and just rule egypt <laughs> as like a, a warrior case for like 700 years that's a pretty successful does um, that even count as a slave up without count as a slave uprising or is that it might do yeah. it's, hmm. that's really interesting yeah. Mam the mamluks then, also defeated the were one of the first to defeat the mongols right or the yeah. first yeah, something like that they stopped the mongols uh getting into into egypt they did that. It's a pretty big feather in their um, cap. <laughs> and then the, of course, the Mongols were supplying the slaves as well. They were like supplying the Mamluks through the trade routes. Really? <laughs> Whoops. <Yeah. laughs> Talk about, yeah, it's kind of like the Valyrians torching their own empire by digging too deep and blowing themselves up or wh however that actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's like supplying your yeah. enemy with the tools to destroy you. <laughs> Interesting. Huh. And what about the Janissaries? And then so the Janissaries were Ottoman um, soldiers mm. who were taken. They were and taken from like the European possessions um, as children. They were Christians, taken away, um, brought up as uh, um, Islamic, um, and as yeah, soldiers for the empire. Um, so by taking being taken away from their family at such a young age um you just their whole life became the janissaries mm. um and they became like the crucial arm of the uh the ottoman empire and its expansion and its decline were these soldiers uh castrated like the unsullied i don't think they're castrated but they were not allowed to um like legally have children like they couldn't pass on any inheritance any roles okay so it was like the they they couldn't like continue that group by like they had to like go out and get more rather than like being able to expand the group from within that kind of thing okay was there anything else like particularly interesting about their training that's maybe similar to the unsullied other than just like extreme martial training or was there any sort of like obviously there's there must have been behavioral training to keep them loyal which with the mamluks didn't work out did what was the long term on the janissaries too while you're at it how did that so, end? uh all so badly like <laughs> i'd say generally like slave soldiers are not a good idea because if you've got enslaved people like if you want to keep them enslaved, giving them all the weapons. <laughs> if, if like, yeah, you kind of, the intuitive <laughs> nature of that arrangement does kind of show itself. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the Mamluks, yeah, they take over and they end up ruling Egypt. What happens with the Janissaries is they eventually wield a lot of power. They're, the, they're so close to the Sultan. Uh, they're protecting him. They have all the influence. Mm. Um, so they start thinking, okay, well, what we're going to do is protect ourselves. And so it becomes less disciplined. It becomes uh, like more luxurious. It becomes like a drain on resources. They stop like innovating. They stop being that interested in martial training. Mm. Um, and then eventually some people start to think, oh, wait, maybe we need to do something about this. Let's reform oh, wait, all the people with the weapons are the Janissaries. So they quash anything like that, and the Ottoman Empire ends up stagnating. Wow. And it takes many like civil wars for them to eventually get rid of the Janissaries, that they're such a drain um, wow. on it, to the extent that the Ottoman Empire gets known as the sick man of Europe, <laughs> because it's stuck in this lethargy for like 200 years, wow. where it can't reform anything because the... People who control the military aren't going to do any reforms because they're the people who'd suffer. They're like, oh, we've got this very cushy life. We've got all the weapons. We've got all the money. Why would we change things? <laughs> that makes sense. 
Wow. Are there any other maybe famous examples worth tossing out as a brief mention? or Because uh, I, I don't know of any others out there in, in history. Maybe there were some like in the Far East or maybe other nations. or uh, There are some similar things. I, I'm not quite slavery, but um, the British Empire with press ganging oh, people. Yeah, well, maybe. that's awful. Yeah. But, yeah, if you're poor it's like oh well you're you're part of the royal navy now you'll be stuck in this ship in the dark go sail around the world being fired at by the french um i think we should clarify maybe it's a little quick. more let's just, let me yeah. let me clarify what a press gang is to folks out there just in case you're not clear on it basically a lot of times you would have a situation where you're a dude you're at a bar you're someone who comes up and offers you to, to buy you a bunch of drinks. Next thing you know, you're passed out and you wake up on a ship and you've been conscripted. Now you now you're on that crew. And if you do anything, if you try to act out, you know, you get punished as if like in a military situation. If you don't follow orders, you get beaten or whatever. Yeah. So you're for it's forced conscription. That's it's essentially mm -hmm. slavery. You can't you literally can't leave. You're on a ship. I mean, where are you going to mm -hmm. go? And that scenario is a little more unique than what we've been talking about, because it's hard for them to rise up. Right. Like individual people scattered around ships across the ocean they can't like coordinate and rise up you yeah. know what i mean mm -hmm. you don't have 90 percent of the ship isn't <laughs> conscripted in there it's you know two or three guys but so they they're just stuck there's no you don't get revolts uh from that yep. well you you sort of do because it was part of what the americans were upset with the british for like it mm -hmm. it, it can lead to it if it's eventually enough. yeah like eventually it can it can the system can blow up on itself but it can take a while before that the rot in the system creeps in or what have you and that but that's also a great segue sean because we have for example the nation of bravos was founded by v sailors who overthrew the slavers on the ships that they were forced to row on. And they were like, well, we're going to go make ourselves a new nation here in Bravos. So in that case, as an example where there were so many slaves, they were able to rise up because the, the master, the group of masters was small enough and there were the slave population massively outnumbered them. And I want to talk about that with sailors. That's really relevant because we may have d d right now at the end of a dance with dragons, the volunteer fleet is headed towards slavers Bay <laughs> and they're headed to overthrow the, the the breaker of shackle breaker breaker of shackles. That's almost as hard as Irish wristwatch. And <laughs> didn't, they're like, oh, we're going to kill the dragon queen. And people are like, you know, you're sending a lot of slaves towards the person that is known for freeing slaves. Right. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and they're 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 wielding weapons and pirating, like leading the ones rowing the ships like she might just they might just turn join her you know you, have you thought about that at all uh volantis you know <laughs> so yeah you can really see george's i think george is setting up a lot of these slave systems to fall as he did in the past with valeria uh he, he makes them really awful in part because it allows him to destroy them and, and then we get to go yes <laughs> it's something for us to celebrate <laughs> no i i don't know i I want to point out one way that the Spartans used their slaves at, from a logistical standpoint. They had them manage the supplies of the military. Yeah. They didn't give them the weapons, but they're like, bring the, you're coming along to help us move our supplies. And uh, I can't think of an example in the, in Martin world of that, but it seems like a good way. It would have to be. Like, yeah. I don't want to be slaves yeah. in battle. Yeah. You definitely see that like around some of the, the tents of the rear knees. There's just like dudes who are in helping people get dressed and all that. It's not like a big point of discussion, but it's definitely there. And yeah, that would make, and that's even true that there's, it's like a, even modern war. That's kind of a forgotten thing. Like not slaves necessarily, but also slaves, but like there's lots of like women who, who helped like load cannons and run, gunpowder back and forth on the front lines they were in just as much danger as almost any other soldier but their like role was essentially forgotten uh and this is a similar thing here you've got slaves who probably like you said didn't ever wield a sword or pick up a weapon but were like arrows flying around you know can cannonballs or catapult stones or fire leaving their homes and farms and families behind to do it yeah all that stuff so yeah it's really we can't let, something that george gives us the opportunity to do is in his writing is he he leaves room for us to think about the the, the forgotten people um and uh apply that to the real world a little bit or a lot sean you know i, I gotta apologize i forgot to ask as we always do what you were drinking today Better late than never. Oh. What are you drinking today? <laughs> well, this is just the blood of a dragon. Oh. 
That's fake. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> nice. But this is the the Rainbow Machine Naked Drink mixed with the Strawberry Bang mixed with Raspberry Sparkling Ice. Hmm. Have Weird. you tried, Sean? They have a raspberry <laughs> lemonade or whatever, like a raspberry Mountain Dew or something I saw. I have tried it. I didn't really oh, like it. I don't like lemon. I don't like tart. Yeah. It was. I mean, it wasn't like gross, but I, I wouldn't choose it. Hmm. Sean gives it That's one thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, next quote. This refers to a lot of the the mining and the demand, the the hunger for resources and slaves and all that. None can say how many perished, toiling in the Valyrian mines, but the number was so large as to almost defy comprehension. As Valyria grew, its need for ore increased, which led to ever more conquests to keep the mines stocked with slaves. The Valyrians expanded in all directions, stretching out east beyond the Giscari cities and west to the very shores of Essos, where even the Giscari had not made inroads. This circles a little bit back to what we were discussing with regard to how the increase in demand increases the demand. The cycle just becomes permanent and ever growing and the hunger for wealth and slaves just is is never it's never possible to sate it, which is a symbol, a kind of a symbolic of the attitude of these people at the top that are ruling the nation. They are also endlessly hungering for power and wealth and, and uncaring as to who suffers for it. And this is also um something to think about in terms of why uh in terms of rome and carthage and and how these theaters of war were were operated Uh, we talked about it before the silver mines of spain were a big deal you read about ancient mining and it's just one of the most horrible things that i've ever read about not just and it's not just the treatment of the people which by itself is is horrible but it's also just like the massive ecological devastation it's just horrible, right, Jamie? It's just it's 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 yeah. tough to read about. It's, I mean, a lot reading about the ancient world makes you very uncomfortable. Yeah, it, that's true. It, it, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. One of the extreme things that is, yeah, I, I can. Th- there aren't many worse things that I, yeah, that you just wouldn't want to do than being stuck in a one of those mines. Yeah, Nina mentions the Valerians putting slaves to work in brutal and extremely dangerous conditions. Not only the normal dangers, George, of course, even this goes up a notch. Even the brutality of mining in his world is worse because of things like fireworms, which exist in these deep tunnels. You've got creatures, (laughs) fantasy creatures that are deadly and dangerous that don't exist in the real world. And she also uses Haiti again as an example where instead of mining, it's the sugar, sugar plantations, which maybe that doesn't sound so awful. I mean, it's slavery, so of course it sounds awful, but sugar were like just sugar plantations like the sugar was boiling hot like the sugar pressing you could like people lost limbs repeatedly and you're already in the caribbean so imagine you're boiling and you're in tropical heat i mean that's just uh, i mean that that might reach the level of these mines of terms of the intensity it wouldn't reach the level of the toxic gases and and the things like that this is where the faceless men were formed it was so intense that it spawned a, a whole like death cult religion that has some actual magic in it. So yeah, pretty, pretty savage. <clears throat> so um, yeah. So what about, what are some other examples? We I mentioned the, the Romans in Spain. What are some other maybe similar real world examples that, uh, that come to mind from you, Jamie? Um, the, I think the ultimate one would be the Spanish uh, colonies in Peru. I think that's oh, just the, really, in terms of slavery that the treasure that, fleets and all that yeah the uh yeah the mines in peru and in in central mexico that the scale of slavery involved i think it, it's difficult to comprehend like how many millions of people died Goodness. in those mines um though saying that um about magical death cults it's just made me wonder about sort of like voodoo and like the birth of like a oh, wow. sort of religious thing um, amongst a slave community. Um, but that's an interesting analogy I hadn't really thought of before hmm. 30 seconds ago. That is really interesting. Voodoo Earlier, makes me think of the faceless man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 The uh, A couple episodes ago, we talked about the, the hoodoo um, slave religion uh, in America, which maybe 
have would you have gotten to that in America? In your so, okay, you, well, you'll, oh, yeah. you'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're still. Yeah, I guess that's more like 1840s. 50s, I forget. We, we we talked about that another time. It's very interesting, and it, it's got some similarities to the um, Unsullied's religion of worshiping their the mother of spears, where they don't talk about it. They don't. It's only we don't even talk about it to outsiders. And that was mm -hmm. the the Hoodoo religion is similar, so it's part of why we don't know a lot about it. Um. All right, so moving on, f further expansion. We got a pair of quotes here, different uh, parts of the world of ice and fire um, that have a similar take here. With the fall of Volgis came the great surge of conquest and colonization from the freehold of Hilaria as they expanded their domains and sought more slaves. And then we also have... It was this first bursting forth of the new empire that was of paramount importance to Westeros and the future Seven Kingdoms. As Valyria sought to conquer more and more lands and peoples, some fled for safety, retreating before the Valyrian tide. That last line in particular refers to the Andals, but also the Rhoynar, of course, later, even though the, the Rhoynar were uh, an older people than the Andals, and surely peoples that have been forgotten to Martin world history, people who fled to places other than Westeros. In the east, We've got the northern portion along, sort of it separates Slaver's Bay. You've got water to the south, and then there's the land mass that runs connecting Valyria to Slaver's Bay, where the Demon Road is now. Presumably there was no Demon Road that far back, but that's where Mantaris, Borash, Talos, Illyria, and the Isle of Cedars would be. The Isle of Cedars, of course, is where Victorian visited the where those monkeys were and he had those really bad dreams and he thinks about the doom and it's really cool <laughs> uh talos is really interesting because there's another micro uh influence from the ancient world here talos is known for its slingers which reminds me of the balearic slingers from so yeah. what's what's the, why so why does why did that happen do we know why are the balearic islanders so good at slinging whereas out pretty much everywhere else in the ancient world there was bow and arrows is, is it just the available natural resources or is this something else i think it's you kind of get that you just get traditions that sort of spring up okay. and then they become like self-fulfilling so you get um that uh people from the balearic islands really good at slinging uh Cretan archers is a famous one um uh like sort of missile throwers from the Illyrian coast, that kind of thing. Okay. That, that makes sense. Just whatever like the local traditions are. Okay. Yeah. So like once they just some it becomes a thing and then it stays a thing. Everyone teaches their you know, you teach your kids how to sling and <laughs> they teach their kids how to sling and why would yep. they ever take up a bow, you know? <laughs> Unless they were born into somewhere where that was being taught. Yeah. Right on. Okay. Then of course, Slaver's Bay itself is is pretty straightforward. Uh, the Valyrians, you know, made their way across, I suppose. Then the, farther east is the the Quathai people, which is Karth. But there's also the Red Waste, and the Red Waste had already been forming back then, so it wasn't appealing to the Valyrians. I, we can guess. Um, also, Karth was probably a great trade partner. They may have just may have made more sense to just keep that rather than stretching so far to the east across a desert to try to conquer a, a pretty big city, um, triple with their big triple walls. It probably wouldn't have been easy even with dragons. So to the west is more where they focused. Volantis is pretty much right there when you exit the peninsula, and it's still there. It still has blood of the ancient blood within. It still has people worshiping Valyrian gods inside the black walls. So there's a lot of old Valyria is still kind of kept there and we very much hope we get to get some of those tidbits in future books. The Roin are of course a big deal. The Roin itself was a temporary expansion barrier because even though dragons can fly right over that, the troops, you, you, you can't hold a city with just dragons. It's just like you can't conquer a city with an air force. You can level the ground and make it easier for the troops to come in, but you're never going to hold it with just planes or air force. It's the same thing here. So once they were yeah, able to cross. That's what I was about Karth also. Like the dragons could fly to Karth and destroy it, but you can't get the troops across yeah. the desert to yeah. maintain you it. You saw what happened when Danny tried to go across the desert. It was it was rough. Yeah. And it wouldn't be that much easier for the troops. Just Alexander the Great took his army through a desert. That that wasn't great. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people died. A lot of people died. A lot of deaths. Though. Yeah. So the Andals were were pushed towards the axe. And we'll talk about them more later. You can look at the maps, kind of get in a sense of where that is. Basically, just farther north and west away from Valyria. And, of course, in the regions where the free cities are now, there were already people there. In some cases where the Valyrians just displaced them, enslaved them, killed them, all of the above, built new cities, took over existing cities. Endless examples of that that there would be not much point of George writing about. Um, 
uh, though he might if he chose to. <laughs> so, yeah, so we we talk about like Rome. Just like Valyria, it was the center. Like not just the center, it was the cultural center, economic center, religious center. And it's I think it's kind of hard for us to maybe visualize just how big and wealthy and how many like trophies and displays of wealth just at its peak were present there. And Valyria was probably the same with just a little more magic mixed in. And, you know, there's some art with like lava flowing through channels, like as if it was like the, the, <laughs> the canals of Bravos or Venice, but lava instead of water, which I'm not sure if that's really how it was. It's pretty cool though. So, <laughs> so let's talk a minute, Jamie, about power being just so concentrated in one spot when it's such a vast amount of territory they're ruling and just how big it gets, how wealthy it gets and, and how it's hard for us to maybe conceive of that. And and that is a reason as well why the Valyrian families stayed there, why they didn't just go try, oh, I'm going to go live over here. No, everything's in the center. You stay there. So let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a like self-fulfilling prophecy almost, like um, when you've got such power um, that it's natural that things start to attach themselves to it. Mm. So if you like, start off, basic with the cycle you've got someone who is powerful who's probably the most wealthy person in an area so you're going to start having luxury resource makers who will gather themselves near there because the emperor is the only person who can afford to buy things like this so you'll have other people who are like oh if i want nice things i need to go to this place and then money just starts to become concentrated and then you've got wherever power is, like there's also the political aspects of it. Like you want to be uh, close to someone, you want to be having chats with people. Like that's where you will like, be able to show off like your role. You'll be able to gain positions through that. Um, there's a load of examples of that in like a medieval European history, like um, mm. where you want to be like oh the uh, uh, the. I mean, the Privy Chamber is like a, or the Privy Council is the famous example in Britain. Like it's, oh yeah, the people who go to the toilet with the king, that's where you get to chat with them. <laughs> the Privy Council, that's literally the, I always wondered why it was called that. It's really because of that. Wow. Yeah. Know. That is maybe another thing that would happen too, is there would be like, there's this cycle of someone wealthy attracts someone who supplies for the wealthy. And once you have that there, then more wealthy want to be there for that. That will also start to draw in other things like, just simple knowledge people who aren't necessarily even wealthy or powerful but the people in that area are going to be more exposed to the culture that's brought in from these other people and the trade that is coming from it and everything it, it becomes not just a center of wealth but also of culture and art and communication and everything else right on yeah you have that with a lot of like um french cities in the 1700s like um you think of like the all the resources for, like the luxury furniture that grow up around Paris for supplying Versailles and then like the silk working in Lyon um, just to for fashion. Um, and then that becomes like the center of the city and you get a whole city just because it's a convenient trade point between um, Paris and the uh, silk farms in Italy that you get a whole city mm. out of it. Interesting. What about other like shining cities in the Mediterranean. Did Rome have like a policy of diminishing them or did they just outshine them or what was their, did they sort of try to aggressively stop any other city from getting even getting sort of even close to their I mean, Carthage kind of would be an example, I suppose, but are there other examples like that? Or they just, did they just dominate so much that it didn't really matter? Or, I'm curious about that. They, I think dominate like militarily and then that leads on towards the cultural domination ah. so you've got the um all political power in the mediterranean is attached to i mean at one stage either alexandria or uh, rome so they're the two major cities um you get a few others like uh, i guess antioch from like the remnants of the uh old seleucid empire um but once Rome's conquered the Mediterranean, it's Rome is where all the power is. So everything starts to centralize there until you get to the point at which um, Rome's no longer strategically useful. Um, when you start to have the emperor needing to move around the empire more and then power gets sucked away from Rome 
and gets attached to wherever the emperor happens to be. Like you get a new cycle mm. of the emperor locates somewhere, then the court relocates there, then the merchants relocate there, then everything relocates there. Um, so you have the birth of like new powers. Like I mean, Constantinople is the famous one when Constantine moves there. But you'll have that with like that's where Milan becomes significant when you get a, an emperor there. When Trier in in like the French Germany becomes significant because you've got an emperor there. Hmm. Perhaps another solid comparison here, one that fits in very well because a lot of this has its origins in Italy, which probably even dates back to a lot of ancient stuff. Like there's maybe a through line to modern or semi-modern mafia. When you think about 40 families, that sounds like the five families of New York. I mean, these are powerful families that do what they want as long as they don't mess each other up. They, they, can, they tolerate evil and dirty deeds to uh, to a maximum extent as long as they aren't aimed at each other and they do the moth the five families they sort of they meet and they discuss like the territory and who gets to control this and they they talk it out so they don't all destroy each other because they're all very prone to violence as we know so to kind of make sense is like a survival instinct for them to not just go straight to that like hey we're kind of on we're not on the same team but we don't need to be enemies. So I kind of feel like that's a similarity to the 40 families. Like what you were just describing is that the Valyrians wouldn't have a, a moving court because they didn't have an emperor, but they would have mm. various dragon rider families going to different corners of the empire, the freehold, putting out fires or starting them because dragons do that. <laughs> <laughs> that analogy doesn't work quite as well, but you know, dealing with problems that are more personal to their sphere of control of their family, something that's not a national issue and something that's not an imperial issue. So you would have like lots of miniature versions of what you just described, like a court, uh, like a dragon rider maybe brings a few people with them. Sometimes they would just go on their own because mm -hmm. it's just a dragon and they can't bring everybody with them. <laughs> but, but they might have like local, like a local magistrate that's loyal to their family that they are in contact with and mm -hmm. things like that. You know, these, that might even be something that held back certain wars from happening. Mm. If a Valerian shows up on a dragon to some city and says, hey, I can either burn you down or you give me, you know, 100 horses. They're going to give them 100 All right, horses. here's 100 horses. Yeah. And yeah. they come back every year and they do that. And, it, you know, as long as I'm here getting these 100 horses, I, I brought some gold from my mines. Let me buy your art, your jewelry, your whatever. It, it, merchants might start to appear to appeal to the Valerians. And I, I can money. see how... <laughs> As yeah. Jamie wrote that in the document for a different point. It really <laughs> works here too. <laughs> and you can see how this sort of like oh, mafia-like relationship might have built up in some of the bordering territories of Valeria or even outside if they could fly there were dragons that would have kept the desire from war at bay. Yeah, like for example, okay, so this 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 brings up another concept that I'm I don't know a lot about with Rome, but I I do. It's familiar, and and Jamie, you can explain a little better that I, I imagine it applied to Valeria because we know Valeria sent archons, which we know is a Greek term, well started as one, and now it's used in other places for like a temporary ruler. And this for this in this context, it's like a temporary ruler, mm -hmm. like a a short term dictator maybe, but without maybe quite that level of power. Client kingdoms is what I'm getting at. What? How does yeah. that relate? To, I, I imagine Valeria maybe had a lot of things that they sort of controlled, but like the free cities, they weren't, they were free. Mm -hmm. They weren't ruled directly by Valeria, but they owed their allegiance to Valeria. They were like, don't step out of line or Valeria's going to come down on you. But day to day, you can call your own shots as long as you're, you know, mm -hmm. you don't drift from our sphere. So I, that's kind of the equivalent as client kingdoms. The difference being they weren't yeah. their city states and they didn't have kings. But other than that, it's pretty similar. So why don't you talk about that for a minute? So like the basic idea of a, a client kingdom, yeah, you've got someone who is like a ally of the of your states, um, but you've got a high degree of influence there. Like you can tell them what to do. Um, it's useful because it's cheap. Like um, having to directly rule somewhere is very expensive. It's a lot of effort. Like if you're a Valeria, you don't want to be, you want to be in Valeria. You don't <laughs> yeah. want to be stuck <laughs> off in uh, in Tyrosh <laughs> looking after them. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So it's a lot easier to just have them do what you say without you having to be there. Um, so how that works in the ancient world is. As the Roman Empire is forming, there'll be a lot of like existing kingdoms. And then rather than having to send the legions in to go conquer them, it's a lot easier to just say, okay, we'll leave you to your own devices, but um, 
like we, you have to do what we tell you and if someone tries to invade us through you you do the fighting um so they've kind of got that as like a defensive perimeter like around the vulnerable bits um that eventually gets solidified where the romans do conquer most of these client kingdoms um, and then that reaches its zenith around Hadrian, where you start getting like lot, like walls being built, like Hadrian's Wall, oh, yeah. used as like a way to like push power beyond a static line. Mm. But Rome is directly on the frontier. Um, but then you get into the same problem of, or a different problem of, if you're trying to defend a static line and you breach that line, then all of a sudden you're very, really vulnerable. Mm. So you get a retransition in like the three hundreds where the romans start to like delegate power back to local authorities mm. which is the origins of feudalism like um, oh. the latin word for uh, these allies is um foederati which is where you get feudal and federates from nice mm. like this dispersed power so during the barbarian invasions um what kind of happens is they set up these certain like friendly states and use them as like allies that they can then balance power around so it's like okay the franks they can settle in northern france they will defend northern france for us the vandals they can settle in southern spain they will defend north africa for us and then that goes on for about 50 years until all the barbarians just gang up on rome and get rid of them um (laughs) but um when done well, it can be a really useful way of like balancing power and doing it cheaply. Hmm. Makes sense. And the Romans would be skilled and and experienced with various forms of control, various forms of government, various mm-hmm. forms of exerting influence. That's again getting back into like what a nation gets good at and how they apply that to the mm-hmm. rest of the world. Yeah, that, that also bleeds into what we're talking about with mafia stuff. And the mafia is really good at influence through indirect means violent and, and under the radar and it's whether that control is exerted kind of behind the scenes or just out in front like we're going to blow you up melt you with our dragons if you don't listen it, it has a similar end result sean so is he before we go i assume we're about to go on to war elephants yeah <laughs> uh let me i want to bring up a tangent that might be a little bit of a segue to this cool i was thinking about Genghis Khan and how completely dominant, how completely, I think more so than like the Spartans over anyone yeah, or anyone most, over more, anyone. One of the most dominant militaries of all time. Yeah. Right. It just seemed virtually unstoppable. And, and, and comparing this to Valyria, how yeah. they were relatively new, they kind of came out of nowhere and just rolled over cities and states that had existed for I don't know, centuries. I don't know, I don't know if ancient is quite the word for them. But um, so one, a lot of times we've compared the dragons to uh, maybe uh, climate change, but also maybe nuclear bombs. Mm-hmm. I don't know if, you know, if that's the closest level in the real world of disparity of power from, you know, nuclear bombs, mm. dragons, the, the Mongol horde, I think, might be the, the biggest disparity in the level of power and capability of a military compared to the rest of the world. So, and and one, I think it's a good parallel to Valeria, how they kind of came kind of suddenly, dominated, and then kind of went away kind of quick, too, relatively. Mm. Um, so, one, I, I just thought, that my mind was spinning on this a little bit. Mm. I wanted to ask, Jamie, maybe if you could think of another time, another moment in history or a military force that was maybe at that level. Um, and and beyond that, what comparisons there might be to Valeria when you think about the Mongols? Good question. I really like that question. I think that's a great <laughs> comparison. Um, <Thank> you. <laughs> yeah, the um, yeah the way the Mongols kind of explode onto the scene and are just very good at dominating a large swathe of Central Asia. Um, I think similarly uh, to that, the the Huns um with how like another step people who are very good at um sort of like cavalry um warfare they've got the great bows the same way the mongols do um and then you've got the extra layer of the huns drive people ahead of them so like the huns move into eastern europe which then drives the 
Visigoths and the Vandals and the Goths off into Rome, and then that starts the cascade of invasions into other invasions, uh, similar to I guess like the like the the Andals moving westwards. Oh yeah, Where that's interesting and similar with the, yeah. uh, the Mongols. There's the um, what are they called yeah Kipchak I think. Kipchak, I think. Yeah, yeah, that they chase from essentially like central uh, like Siberia, all the way across Asia. Like um, that's a lot of how, how the Mongol conquest happens. Is they got into a conflict with the Chipyat. I can't say that word. <laughs> and then um, they each state ends up hosting them, and then they lose, and then they move on to the next one, and then just gradually chasing yes. them, sort of accidentally over about twenty, thirty years. Wow. Um, so that would be interesting, like the how the it's like chasing a particular enemy. I suppose you could compare that maybe to I don't know, like uh, moving against Gis. Hmm. It's like that that pursuance around the area, moving all the the different bits, all the different cultures associated with that, and chasing it down. Hmm. Um, you end up in conflict with the Roin when you're going after Gis. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> Like as your your horizons are suddenly so much bigger, you're doing a lot more. You just get tangled up in more and more conflicts doing that. That when you're trying to do something with guess you move a fleet somewhere, and whoops, you've sparked a war with somebody else. Oh yeah, the allies. Yeah, the entangling alliances, or even I mean, beyond what you're saying, there's this too. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. One, um, unless we're unless you had anything else on that, Sean or Jamie, we can move on to uh, war elephants. I'd yeah. say the, the Mongols also uh, good communication networks. Yeah. Like that's one of the most underrated things about the Mongols is that um, they had an excellent uh, like messaging system. A precursor to the Pony Express, they, basically, right? Kind of like that. Pretty much. Yeah. Like they're like a Central Asian equivalent of the the Roman roads with the um, horse, like fresh horses. Like the guy would run, you know, gallop all night, switch horses, yeah. keep going. Yeah, like. It's yeah, when the when they started to account encounter european army something like you know one in a hundred of the european army would have a horse whereas <laughs> each mongol had four horses <laughs> each yeah, one yeah. had four you know yeah uh, and that's a, that's oh. a real like territory thing to you talk about how the romans weren't very good with cavalry and, and neither were the greeks for the most part except you get into northern greece like thessaly but yeah it's just it's just territory like they just you don't raise horses on hills and, and mountains you know that's a flat ground thing and the mongols had a lot of that Another thing that I've just thought of, the um, environmental factors like limiting um, migration, like one of the things that gets talked about when steppe nomads generally move into Europe is the uh, the moisture, that Europe is very moist, uh, there's a lot of rain, mm. and how that can affect the bows and make them less useful. Oh, yeah. And that kind of limits how far westward they could go. Uh like whether you'd consider like and how far dragons could go from Valyria, like how far north can dragons go? Yeah, like is that going to affect where where the freehold goes? And that yeah, that's more relevant to perhaps the main series at this point is whether they can go how far north they can go and all that. Yeah, because I don't suppose Valyria probably didn't run into a whole lot of icy climates. They're so they're so tropical and they're rooted. But you're right, like that would be a barrier to them. And like if they did run into that, be like they'd be like nah. <laughs> let's not go let's not go here it's a snowy place let's not go to it. <laughs> it seemed like drogo seemed to have like a calling back like he didn't want to get too far away from home the mother of mountains right? yeah, like it's a I, religious thing yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i i wonder if maybe the the dragons maybe when they get to cold territory or if they get a certain distance away from valyria or mm. whatever or their home whatever they recognize magic as home. source or whatever yeah that makes sense yeah there is Might some a, there is some like homing sort of instinct. an invisible yeah invisible barrier for them yeah that's that's really neat you know one other kind of minor but it's just a little another point something i learned at one point that uh, another reason for the success of the mongols would have been they had something genetically that allowed them to process lactose and so they could drink the horse milk they could bring their food with them and yeah, other armies they got used to that. do that so easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you've, there's plenty of modern examples of certain cultures not being adapted to dairy or yeah, or different different foods or or hot food, <laughs> spicy foods or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> we all yeah, we all uh, are, are used to what we're used to. 
Okay, let's talk about war elephants. Pretty interesting topic. It's more related to this. Wouldn't this is less directly related to Valyria, but it is related because they would have probably fought against them. I don't know that, uh, that they had them as part of their armies, but they might have because they subjugated nations that that would have had access to this. That's less clear. It's not mentioned anywhere, but it makes some sense, especially because Jamie, one of your first notes here is it's a sh it's a show of magnificence, and we know Valyria mm -hmm. was all about that, showing them what they could control and rule and dominate. Elephants, one of the largest animals there is. Why not that too? So first question, how were they used in battle? Because what we're building up to is how they're going to be used in battle in Westeros, including how they might deal with things that we've never seen in the real world, like facing dragons. So <laughs> mm -hmm. let's build, work our way up to that, starting with just the, the, the basics. So there are a few different ways that you can use um, elephants. Um, they're one, they're scary. <laughs> it's good to like put them at the front of the army. They're going to freak the opposition out. You think, how on earth am I going to deal with that? And that's just the people. Like they scare horses as well. So if you've got a cavalry-based army, that they're going to be really nervous around the elephants. They aren't going to like it. Um, I link that to the Dothraki. How you will? Um, yeah, I wonder about that. And so that's thing number one. They're scary. Thing number two, um, the height. So you can use them as platforms both for seeing the battlefield and getting a good picture oh. of it and for um missiles so you might have like a little like turret structure on top of the elephant that you'll use for archery um like in scatter like a lot further because you've got the height advantage than you could if you were on the ground also on a little smaller scale but as you said before communication you could just project commands farther from oh, that just height. like yeah vocal that's that's a good point that's a really good point yeah. the visual the visual that's something that people don't maybe think about a lot is just like the, the general or the commanders being able to see what's happening is just so important and hannibal we're using him as a lot of example here he was one of the best generals that's ever lived and he mm -hmm. had an elephant he would he would do that a lot like eventually that elephant died didn't it um or I don't know. I guess we don't. Is that not clear what what the deal with his elephant was? But <laughs> oh yeah, the, yeah about it dying. Yeah, eventually. The, um, yeah, I think mo yeah most of them all but one died crossing the Alps, and there was one that got looked after. But it was like almost like a pest at that point, so they didn't uh, want to risk it in battle. Uh, okay. Yeah, elephants crossing the Alps. That's just like what? <laughs> like, that really happened? Yeah. Well, not really because they didn't survive it. Yeah, <laughs> he tried. It was audacious. <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, so that sounds really interesting. Uh, the horses thing, can horses get used to elephants? Can they like, is that a thing, a skill they can acquire getting like comfortable around elephants? Is that a, is there examples of that or is it just, eh? uh, they, they do sometimes I think it's more a thing in like Indian warfare that you'll have like chariots uh, and um, elephants operating in close proximity, but in terms of like, uh, Rome and Carthage, they tend to be kept separate rather than okay. integrated into separate units. So what when a battle starts, you've got we've talking about the, the visibility, the using it as a missile platform. What about uh like a direct assault? How were they used in terms of like charges, like a cavalry charge? What's an elephant cavalry charge look like? Or how what was their goal and and, and like anything you can describe about it, I'm sure people would love to hear. So the basics of military strategy are you want to use your infantry to pin down the enemy line and then use your cavalry to hit them from the side or back mm. uh, so it's called the uh, the sword and shield approach use the shield to hold them go around them with the sword mm. um, so that basic principle gets applied in lots of different ways um, but in terms of the warfare being used in the Mediterranean, you tend to have like um, phalanxes, um, so like shield walls uh, that clash up against each other. And then you want to ideally use your elephant to go around the back and just smash into oh. the phalanx from the back. Okay. And when the phalanx gets hit by that, it will disintegrate. If there's a gap in the phalanx, then the infantry can go in and just eat it from the inside out. So that's that's the goal. Use the cavalry to disrupt and allow the infantry to get in. I think what we've seen portrayed in movies, when you see like I don't know, Lord of the Rings, where there were the oliphants, they they seem to be portrayed more as like you just send them right at the front lines and just break everything apart. Is that not very realistic? Or is maybe just it's... a few examples of that maybe? it's less useful like you can do it and there are examples of it happening but elephants are also very unpredictable uh, 
so they're going to do their own thing. <laughs> if you send them into a wall of spikes, they don't like it. They're just going to turn around and run back like, at no. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Common sense. Elephants aren't as dumb as a lot of animals. They're pretty smart. Yeah. yeah they never forget either. <laughs> yeah, they don't forget. And they're like, no, I, I didn't want to do that last time. And yeah, I don't want to do that this time. I... <laughs> I read, I think maybe it was at Zama as well, was it that the Romans had learned a little bit about how to fight with elephants, and so they just, when the elephants came out, they would just move out of the way. They're like, you're not going to disrupt our lines. We're just going to give the room, and then we'll reform. We're not going to get in that thing's way. <laughs> Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. The, um, yeah, the, I think they were used by... Uh, against uh, like Pyrrhus of Epirus uh, yeah. when he invaded Italy in the 280s BC. The Pyrrhic the victory do... guy, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they uh, they get used to it, uh, and then within about two or three battles, they know how to handle elephants. Okay. So elephants aren't really that common in Mediterranean warfare, um, but in cases where there are more established parts of it and they're just integrated into the system like they are in Indian warfare, uh, they're used like up until the 19th century, like partly because wow. they're so good at the um, terrain that when you've got uh, like, uh, like yeah, they're not rough so terrain, mm. they can go in places that cavalry can't do. So they're just kind of used in place of a heavy cavalry. The mud doesn't bother they're... them as much and all that. Okay, yeah, yeah that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess small bodies of water as well, they could just be like, Meh, no problem. <laughs> yeah, I do it. You know, another thing that you didn't bring up that I just assume has got to be a big factor logistically they can carry more weight mm -hmm. your elephant can have more water and food and weaponry or supplies etc mm -hmm. there's also the flip side of that but you need to feed it as well there's a lot of food that <laughs> oh that's <laughs> true yeah elephants <laughs> yeah. do eat a lot i suppose <laughs> so how do you other than learning the tactics like let you know figuring out like the romans did what are what are other ways that you fight back against elephants so elephants are I suppose like any infantry unit, like they're very effective, but they need to be well supported. Like by themselves, they're very weak. So basically, just throw a spear at it. Mm -hmm. um, so what the Romans did to fight the elephants, as well as getting out of the way, is they had units called velites, um, which are sort of lightly armored troops that just carry like a handful of spears that they'll go out, they'll run out, throw them, run back. So they just sent out these units, which could operate unsupported against the elephants, throw a load of spears at the elephants, elephants get killed, um, and then that's that. Hmm. Uh, so to operate effectively, the elephants need to be protected. You need to make sure that lightly armored like um, missile troops can't get near it. Uh. Um, so it needs to be fully integrated into whatever plan you're doing and they need to be protected, used in the right way, used at the right time. If you just send them out there, they're going to get killed. Do they wear armor? Do you have armored elephants? Sometimes, but I, again, it slows them down. Um, yeah. And it's probably it's, hard to armor their trunk and their ears. <laughs> certain parts you know, would be hard. And, yeah. yeah. They need the mobility as well. And then just like getting the thing into it, you know? Mm. Who wants to be an elephant dresser? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so certain things that are maybe set up to happen in Westeros with elephants, have, I don't know of examples that have ever happened in the real world. Like have like knights or the equivalent armored swords and lances ever faced war elephants in the real world? Is that a thing that's ever happened? Um, I don't think so. There tends to be okay. um, like the separate zones of influence, like the knight side of European warfare never got anything close to uh, where war elephants were off in the Far East. By the time that Europeans are engaging militarily in there, they've already moved on to okay. um, like gunpowder. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So there's not much of a, a direct comparison. I suppose the main or the closest would be um, cataphracts, yeah. um, which are sort of like mailed uh, or like um, horses covered in mailed armor, chain mail. That's the way I'm looking Those for. were uh, like from northern, like Black Sea nations, right? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like Middle East, North Africa. Uh, right they on. tend to be used quite heavily. Um, but again, you get the issue of like horses just being terrified of the elephants when they go near. Okay. Yeah. So it's hard to imagine. What would you, just using your best guesses, intuition, how do you think? Uh, like, let's say the Tyrell army 
sets up against the Golden Company, and the Golden Company brings out some elephants. What would you have any predictions for that? Okay, let me throw another wrinkle at it. It seems to be going to be happening in a muddy area. This is the Stormlands. So it's a lot of people's predictions is that this is going to be a, a muddy battle, which, as you said, maybe the elephants aren't going to mind that. The horses certainly will. And archers as well, given what you said about moisture. So that could be a problem. What do you think? What would your guess be about how this might play out? Other, obviously, lots. anything could happen. Mm -hmm. It's George's imagination, but just give us a baseline expectation, I suppose. My money is probably on the Golden Company. <laughs> yeah. I, I think um, the uh, Westerosi armies tend to be a bit disjointed there aren't that many examples of them cooperating in unified ways that you need to to beat them they, they tend to be a bit i suppose when you get with um when it's not a professional army like it's caught like a lot of conscripts who are facing when they see elephants for the first time they're gonna be scared they're gonna freak out of it yeah, they're never gonna have even seen um, such a thing before you're right that's gonna be completely yeah. new they're like that i've never seen that before it's like when john saw yeah. a giant for the first time you know <laughs> yeah. you'll have this small percent of like trained loyal honorable knights who will stand their ground despite their fear or whatever like the... but they won't be able to coordinate everyone else yeah. the way they yeah, need those to those peasant levies are like uh... <laughs> Something to be said for home field advantage. That might yeah. be a factor. Yeah, you're right. Uh, then you've got like, the knights will probably be on horses, and then the horses freak out when they get near the elephants. Yeah. So it could be a yeah, disaster for the Westerosi Fort. It could be like a complete yeah. stomping by the elephants. Yeah. <laughs> They're the, good. Uh, the, the one thing they may have in their favor is the artillery. If they okay. can get some scorpions oh, um, oh. that could take out, a, take out an elephant quite easily. But uh, if it's if it's stormy, if it's rainy, then trying to move around the artillery that might be a bit tricky. But and there probably isn't much to say about dragons versus elephants. I don't suppose that would be much of a contest, but it is worth mentioning that it could happen, right? Either dragons mm. versus regular elephants or versus mammoths in the north. Mammoths would be even more susceptible because of all that hair. Oof. Worth me bringing up in the chat <laughs> to wage war podcast brought up. We talked about this before. Aziz, you can use fire. Elephants are spooked by oh, fire. Oh yeah, yeah. G Jim McGeehan. Hey Jim, how's it going, my friend? Yeah, I did forget about that. You're right. Elephants are afraid of fire. That's a good point. Okay, so they well, dragons all the more reason why they're just really screwed there. <laughs> Always bet with dragons. <laughs> yeah, fire <laughs> is scary too. Uh, well, pretty much everyone. Yeah. Like, are <laughs> yeah. you not scared by fire? Anyone who can experience fear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, especially animals. Okay, well, we've got one. We've got a closing quote. We'll take some final thoughts and then we'll do these questions. A few. We've got a few just questions and comments that we'll close out with. Sean, if you need to go for your, to take a break before your live stream, you feel free. Otherwise, just, you know, stick with us till the end here, but. I'll push it another five minutes or so. Cool. All right. Let's let's uh, read this quote for us then. <laughs> this is our closing quote, folks. In short, the names and numbers of the people who fell to Valeria are largely unknown to us today. What records the Valerians kept of their conquests were largely destroyed by the doom. And few, if any, of those peoples documented their own histories in a way that survived the Freehold's dominion. It's a pretty good outgoing or like outro statement for for this one good writing from george really does kind of cap encapsulate the the grand scale of what we're trying to discuss here and imagine because a lot of it of course is imagination we don't we don't have specifics on a lot of this but so much of it as we can see a lot from jamie's help shows us that real world comparisons a lot of this is just kind of basic understanding of how ancient militaries ancient politics ancient wealth greed some of these things are just similar throughout human history you'd really just need to Add a few details and you can kind of imagine how it would go without having to spin your wheels. These things to stay true throughout the generations and the nations and everything. Uh, any final thoughts, Jamie, on um, that quote or Valeria and Rome or anything else you wanted to say uh, before we move into our goodbye point here? <laughs> um, I'll say that the, I suppose the ultimate uh relationship between like rome and valeria obviously the fall of the roman empire and the doom which i think for whatever you pick that up next time that'll be a that'll be a great thing to get into right on yeah you're right like um comparing to compare those two things if you had maybe like a quick statement on w maybe the the main factors that caused the end of rome that would be similar to the end of valeria obviously without the magic stuff maybe what comes to mind uh i'd say 
uh, environmental factors oh. uh, have to be taken into account, Ooh, um, and large pockets of the civilization that the civilization isn't beneficial for. Mm. That that's fundamentally destable. The snake eating its tail, or a dragon eating its tail, perhaps, is maybe a good metaphor here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It eventually, got to the end. It, got, it ran out of tail to eat <laughs> <laughs> and started chewing on its own head. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so some quick questions. Most of these are just comments. Uh, Two Age War podcast. Uh, here's a fun quote for Sean. It doesn't matter if you have the power in the sky if the enemy can occupy your mess hall. That's right. Jim, yep. Jim, Two Age War was uh, it was in the military, and so was Sean. So these guys are these are <laughs> little soldier <laughs> connections there. <laughs> Uh, here be dragons. Another super chat. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Very generous of you. Says great discussion, y'all. I've got to run. Please come listen to I Know That Nerd with Sean live stream in one hour. Well, well uh, as of then, now it's live stream in twenty minutes. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's cool. Yeah, I'll be checking that out for sure. I hope a lot of you join me. I'll be in the comment section. You can interact with me in the chat there. We got a nice response to the what to call a group of dragons. Urias Tosh says, an eruption of dragons or a flow of dragons. That's pretty good. Mm. Juliano Teixeira Strober says, I would say squad of dragons. That's pretty cool. Dragon squad. <laughs> Form up. <laughs> Liam Mullen says, a clutch of dragons. Ooh, that's good too. Tony Sled says, a storm or a cloud of dragons or a storm cloud of dragons would be cool too. <laughs> Here be dragons says, gaggle of geese. So a draggle of dragons. <laughs> <laughs> given, and maybe given Jim's point, a mess of dragons. <laughs> Indirectly related. Same words. Michael Shelton says, in George R. R. Martin's book, The Ice Dragon, a military unit of dragons is called a wing. Oh, yeah, a wing of dragons. Yeah, like a, like a wing. That's like an Air Force term, too. Sir, Sir Roland de Stark says, a disaster of dragons. Ooh. I like that one. That's good. Nina Friel says, I like a shadow of dragons myself. Ooh, yeah, that's really good because of the shadow. Of wing. That's really good for Song of Ice and Fire because George always talks about the shadow of the wings and all that. Very good. All right, so one last bit from the So Spake Martin, 2012. Someone asked, will we get to see Valyria as it was before the Doom, as it is today? George said, maybe. And then another time he was asked, is there any chance we'll see Valyria? And he said, well, there may be. Not a great chance, mind you. The question is, is it going to be a look at Valyria now or Valyria in the past? So, like, Brand's fever goes into the, you know, uses the Weirwood Network to look deep into the past or Melisandre? Like, it's hard to even imagine how that would happen. Danny having some sort of, ma I mean, she's had visions of the past before kind of more mildly so uh that's just stokes the imagination very interesting i'm curious about that don't know uh where it'll be but hopefully that's a that not great chance actually comes through for us because that's, that's very tantalizing <laughs> george don't do that to us Okay, the trivia question. Last bit. Uh, after taking Marine, Daenerys sends envoys out to several places in the region, seeking allies and trading partners. Which former Valyrian city sends her a cedar chest containing her envoys' heads by way of answer? Of course, that answer being no. Those heads were pickled in brine, not just rotting. It was, you know, a very fancy cedar chest full of heads. The city is <laughs> Mantaris. Mantaris, city of monsters um, known for producing some mutated people two-headed people and things like that kind of weird kind of interesting kind of curious kind of creepy <laughs> thanks so much for joining us jamie this was super fun you were really insightful you really the discussions really just flowed it was it went really smoothly we learned a lot i imagine my uh, the listeners out there were super happy with 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 this discussion please tell everyone remind everyone again of where your podcasts can be found list them out for people and i hope some people go check you out because you're a great podcaster uh so mine are a history of hannibal and the punic wars a history of alexander the great arab spring a history and a history of the united states uh they can all be found on any major pod or any podcaster catching platform um and thanks for having me i've had a great time awesome. and i've learned that i can't say irish whispered <laughs> <laughs> i thought i could redeem myself <laughs> he's gonna go practice <laughs> offline he's gonna be like all right i'm gonna get this just practice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, thanks again, Jamie. That was fantastic. Thanks to Nina for her extra notes. A lot of good notes there. Nina, appreciate the assistance on that. Thanks to our patrons for all the support. You make all this possible, and we can't be thankful enough. We're so appreciative. 
Thanks to Joey Townsend and Jesse Koval for the music. Kevin McLeod for the intro music of Val Arboretus. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld for the uh, maps and the video intro. Thanks to our mods who take care of things over on Facebook and Discord, keeping all the great community discussions going. And of course, once again, let's all go check out Sean on Here Be Dragons. And next week, we'll be back with more Valar Reredus.